This podcast is part of the Planet Broadcasting Network. Visit planetbroadcasting.com for more podcasts from our great mates. Welcome to another episode of Do Go On. My name is Dave Warnicky, and as always, I'm here with Jess Perkins and Matt Stewart. Dave, how good is it to be alive? <laughs> yeah, so good. <laughs> so good. <laughs> I'm like, in my head, I'm like, let's be positive. And I think it doesn't get any more positive than that. <laughs> how good is it? To be alive. Let's all go around the circle and say one thing we're thankful for. Being alive. <laughs> being alive. Oh, um, you can uh, have the same one. Say not being dead. Um, staying alive. Oh, ah. The song. I love song. it. I yeah. love it. Soundtrack love to my life. Love that. Hey, Dave, how does this show work? I think you're in the best position to explain it. Well. Over there. <laughs> over there. Well, this show is uh, it's a comedy show, but also a history show. Where we take it in terms to report on a topic often suggested by a listener uh, to people. They chime in along as the reporter tells them about the topic, and uh, this week it's your turn to chime in, Matt, and you usually start with a question. We do start with a question. This week, the question is, like I've been doing uh, a lot in recent weeks, slightly tangential to the topic itself, because I don't think you'd probably... I, I didn't know the topic, so... Uh, the question is, and this is really... Sorry, just playing into geography nerd Dave's Fuck. hands. Somalia. So I'm gonna Can give, I Google it? I'm, I'm going to give you <laughs> both one guess... <clears throat> but Jess gets first guess. Oh, but that's not good because, all right. You've got a one in 50 chance. That might even help you already. Okay. What is the easternmost state of oh. mainland USA? Nah, no. I had no idea. I have no idea. I was so I'm surprised so where this place was. <laughs> I know there's lots of people from the US watching, but I mean, like, you name a state in Australia. <laughs> yeah, good luck. And there's only six of them. <laughs> Most of them just pick... North, east, south, or west, and put it in front of it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, there's Shut a up, northern, don't help them. There's a western, and there's a south. So you've got a 75% chance of getting it right. It's just the east coast that gave cute little names. <laughs> yeah. Um, Dave, do you have any idea? You would, okay, on a flight, where were we coming back from? There was a flight, you and I were sitting next to each other. Oh, I no. had a nap. Shit. Dave, the whole time, was playing this quiz game that was like naming states in uh, the US. Why the map? All right, Jess, first crack. I Let's wouldn't have a clue. Just say a state. Ready, set, go. <laughs> Are you going to say Cuba? Because no. that's not, not a bad guess. That's not a bad guess. I, mean, I think place. I was about to say Quebec. Okay, well, it's so close to Quebec, actually. It ne- I think it if it doesn't border it, it basically borders Quebec. So you're so close. Dave, you want to have a go? Quebec, obviously, in Canada. I'm all, yeah, that's the only I thing. know. <laughs> But it, I bet you you are closer than Dave looking at his face. Maine? Oh, no, he was right. It's Maine. Oh, <laughs> I, oh my God. <laughs> I was going to say Maine. <laughs> Fuck, I'm an idiot. Okay, great. Maine. I think we learn this every week, Jess. you got to believe in yourself. I just don't. I just don't believe in myself. I truly don't. So that's where this story takes place in Maine. Whoa. Okay, uh, cool. Which is very close to my favourite state. Vermont. Yeah, it is. So it's up in the north. E- it's the most northeastern. Cool. It's in that corner. Yeah, right. It's not the most northern and it's not the most eastern because I think there's a more eastern state that's maybe floating in the sea somewhere. <laughs> I don't know. Cuba. Whatever. Cuba. <laughs> Just floating. <laughs> Dave, it's pronounced Quebec. <laughs> sorry, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Look, I know the places, I just don't know the pronunciation. <laughs> so Quebec. This, okay, silent C. Well, it doesn't even have the C. You insert the C. Gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> this topic was suggested by Josh Josh J. Singh in Manchester in the UK and Jamie Allison from New Brunswick in Canada. New Brunswick's also very close by to cool. Maine. Uh, since the 1980s, this the story has begun. <laughs> oh, thank you. Let me begin. <laughs> the story begins now. <laughs> Since the 1980s, the, city, the citizens of North Pond, Maine, were haunted by a strange and persistent intruder. Oh, yeah. Journalist Michael Finkel has written about the story for both GQ magazine and his own book dedicated to the subject. Michael Finkel. Michael Finkel. Amazing. Finkel comes up a lot. He is the primary and basically only source for the story. <laughs> Finkel is a fantastic is name. A fantastic name. Mickey Fink. Mickey Fink. Oh, Mickey Fink. Mickey the Fink. <laughs> <laughs> he sounds dangerous. Uh, he wrote, 
At first, in the late 1980s, there were strange occurrences. Flashlights were missing their batteries. Steaks disappeared <laughs> from the fridge. Ooh. <laughs> steaks disappeared from the fridge, Dave. I, when you said steak, I went wooden steaks straight Me away. Too, and I was yeah. like, why are they in the fridge? Oh, I'm with you. Uh, new propane tanks on the grill had been replaced by old ones. <laughs> At least My, someone swapped them over. You know? Yeah. They didn't just steal the new one. Yeah. My grandkids thought I was losing my bi- uh, mind, said David Prox, whose vacation cabin was broken into at least 50 times. 50 times? 50 times. That's Imagine replacing many. the batteries in your flashlight 50 times. <laughs> That's frustrating. Why do you need your flashlight so much? Turn on a light. <laughs> <laughs> Grow up. <laughs> Grow up. What are you fucking doing? Grow up and use electricity. Use electricity, you, you idiot. Do they have electricity in Maine? Uh, they do, but this is like a pretty rugged area of sure. Maine uh, on a lake. And some of these cabins don't have electricity. Most of them wow. do, but some of them don't. A lot of them are ho- holiday uh, homes, mm-hmm. uh, although there are permanent residents there as well. I think there, there's hu- a few hundred of these cabins littered around the lakes. Uh, then people began noticing other things. Wood shavings near window locks, scratches on door frames. Was it a neighbour, a gang of teenagers? The robberies continued. Boat batteries, frying pans, winter jackets. All these bits and pieces kept going missing. Why is it always gangs of teenagers? Why do we assume it's teenagers? You know, some teenagers just sitting in their room playing The Sims. Why couldn't it be... (laughs) I mean, there's one. That's an example. (laughs) Why couldn't it be a a gang of old people? Isn't it funny? Because, you know, most crime is done by old people. Yeah, but we're like, oh, bloody kids. But it's never like, I bet this was a gang of middle-aged men. (laughs) (laughs) Which is probably what it normally is. Oh, this Ponzi scheme's hit the town again. (laughs) Bet it's those teenagers (laughs) stealing from the rich. (laughs) My bank account's been hacked. Bet it was a gang of teenagers. (laughs) There was talk like it might, these might be some sort of induction ceremonies where they've got to go steal things. Like hazing. Yeah, these teens. Yeah. Oh, they're fully making it up. You're not in the club until you bring back a pair of AA batteries. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can just pop down the shop. 50 shops. times yeah. from that guy's house. <laughs> oh, all right. Oh, no, if you buy him, oh, no. Because <laughs> I work at the only supermarket in town. <laughs> Still got the barcode on it, you dingus. That's it's in the packet. That's one of the teenager words dingus. from the 80s, dingus. <laughs> Specifically in Maine. Yeah. yeah, they loved it in Maine. The North Pond community was fairly tight-knit. Everyone knew everyone else, but the robberies had some residents pointing the finger at each other. Oh. Even there were two brothers who accused each other of stealing each other's gas and propane tanks. You did it. You took mine. <laughs> you took mine. It's tearing the town apart. It's tearing, it's tearing families they're apart. Te- they're turning on each other in yeah. Maine. Other theories posited that it could have been an antisocial return Vietnam veteran or even one of the hijackers from the 1970s. Sorry, like our they... man D.B. Cooper still <gasps> on the run. Oh. That was one of the theories going around. Really? It could have been D.B. That's when they awesome. say it was an antisocial veteran yeah was there a guy specifically that no. was thinking of or they're just like i bet it's one of those anti-social veterans finally blaming the old people i've heard right? so much about yeah they just it was just a, probably some guy who's anti-social yeah imagine i mean if it turns and out a to teen be, <laughs> if it turns out to be db cooper this would be amazing i'm gonna lose my fucking yeah. mind please please tell us it's him please don't skip to the end that's on page 28 <laughs> Uh, Fear took hold. We always felt like he was watching us, one resident said. And while the police were often called, they were unable to help. The burglaries continued on for decades and the police had nearly nothing at all to go on. No great leads or suspects. Is he taking anything, like anything big or of much worth? No. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. (laughs) The residents started beefing up the security in their homes, getting extra locks and deadbolts installed. Finkel continues. Locks were changed. Alarm systems installed. Nothing seemed to stop him, or her, or them. No one knew. A few desperate residents even left notes on their doors. Please don't break in. (laughs) Tell me what you need and I'll leave it out for you. Simpsons, please don't steal from me. (laughs) Nice one, Rod. He finds the piggy bank and it says, please don't steal from me. <laughs> 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 you know, so they, so they but yeah, left these notes out saying, tell us what you need, we'll give it to you. Because we'll I suppose it if someone's breaking your window or whatever, you've got to pay for the window yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. 
Who cares about the batteries, maybe? But the like your locks or whatever. Yeah, I'll leave you out a twenty-four pack of batteries. I don't yeah. care. Just Please stop breaking my stop windows. Stop breaking the lock. They uh, books often went missing as well. So some people left bags of books out on their porch, saying, "Just take these." But uh, the notes were uh, never replied to. They left pens with the notes. Never, n- never worked. It would take the me books a, were never taken. It would take me a while to realize a book had been taken. I would never realize a book had been taken. You know? Yeah. Unless your bookmark was in it and you'd read it last night, and it was on. Your and it was on my bedside table. It was the one I was reading. Then I'd be like, "That book's gone." But I'd all, I'd assume, and apparently a lot of people did. They'd just be like, oh, "What did I do with it?" Yeah. I've misplaced, and apparently a lot of people had those thoughts, even though their batteries kept missing. They're like, what, what I am I that? doing with these batteries? <laughs> <laughs> I could have swallowed I put new batteries in. Uh, and are these places, are, they, are people living there full time or are they like sort of holiday cabins? Most of these, uh, well, nearly all of these are holiday cabins. Right, so it's easier to, I suppose, break in if no one's home. Yeah. yeah. Uh, incidents mounted and the phantom morphed into legend. The phantom. At a homeowner's meeting in 2002, so this is like 15 years after the first uh, robberies, the 100 people present were asked who had suffered break-ins. 75 raised their hands. Campfire stories were swapped. One kid recalled that he was, uh, when he was 10 years old, all his Halloween candy was stolen. That kid was then 34. <laughs> What? He's still bitter about it, you big fucking nerd. There was these new type of M and M's I'd never even seen them before. Look they were Halloween special, and look. when I tried to replace them at the shops, they'd sold out. I never tried them. I never tried them. <laughs> and that's why I never achieved my dreams. Yeah, that's why I never married because I never learned to trust. <laughs> <laughs> still, the robberies persisted. The crimes after so long felt almost supernatural. Things like jewellery, TVs, computers and cameras were nearly never taken, but propane tanks, batteries and books were. Windows and doors were never broken. Oh, right. There was rarely any trace of anyone having been there. A strange assortment of things were also taken, including outdoor thermometers and Playboy magazines. So not butt thermometers. Not butt thermometers. Very important not to mix out, those two Out up. of butt thermometers. Mm-hmm. And Playboy magazines. Out yeah. of butt Playboy, out of Playboy, magazines? Playboy magazines? Thank you. Well, both. <laughs> Uh, one time, a couple returned to their holiday home to find one of their bunk bed mattresses was missing. <laughs> but this okay. made no sense. The mattress was far too big for it to fit through any of their windows. And the only door to the house remained bolted and padlocked when they arrived. So how did this happen? There's no way of getting this mattress out of the house. Just cut it up into tiny pieces, threw it out the window, vacuumed up. <laughs> Snuck out the window yourself. It's the only explanation. Threw out the mattress. It wasn't I mean, about the mattress. Is there a, I mean, it was about fucking with them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want it. Like, my theory is you get the mattress, you take it out the front door, and then you come back and you bolt the front door and then you leave through the window. I, I think because of the way the lock was, you wouldn't be able to unbolt it and rebolt it. Oh, okay, right. It might have been deadlocked. Okay, it was gotcha. deadlocked and yeah. padlocked as well. I kind of like mine better. Yeah, but <laughs> just to fuck with it. Well, the, the closest <laughs> thing to an explanation uh, that Finkel has was that the thief came in through one of the windows, then took the hinges off the door, being able to sort of creak it open from the hinge side, sliding the mattress out through the gap and then reinstalling the hinges before leaving through the window. That's a lot of work, but... Okay. It's a lot of work and that seems like to what take probably a happened. Yeah. Unless it was an actual ghost stealing them and they use ghost powers. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. Because, I mean, because, Finkel like, didn't mention that. Ghosts but. can go through walls, but if, you, if like, a person is holding the hand of a ghost... Sometimes. ...they can also go through the yes. wall. So maybe if the ghost is holding the mattress... Holding the hand of the mattress. Holding the hand of the mattress... Yeah. Then they can both pass <laughs> through. <laughs> That's what the mattress says as it goes through. <laughs> <laughs> do mattresses talk? They can do when being held by the hand by a ghost. Okay, but, like, just I the mean, one on my bed at home is, like... It's not talking. Well, is there a ghost in the room? I don't know. <laughs> well, you've just moved into a new place. You don't know. It's probably haunted. Everywhere's haunted. Uh, the same couple <laughs> who had their mattress stolen once returned to find their backpack was also stolen. But uh, how did they get it out? Uh, no backpack could fit through a window. Yeah, no backpack could fit The only through a theory was... <laughs> He took the roof off the house, <laughs> tile by tile, <laughs> slowly lifted the back. And they were only gone to the shops for six minutes. Yeah, he's amazing. He or she is an amazing he's master. Ghost. They, they also found that their cabin was six inches to the right. <laughs> brick by brick. 
Just to fuck with them. I came back to work one day and I could swear I had a group of desks. There's about six of us sitting around this open desk. And I could swear that it was about 15 centimetres closer to the window. And no one else could see it, but I could. And I thought, <laughs> I just assumed that they'd done it to fuck with me. Yeah. And had they? I don't know. They still deny it. still haven't it. found out. They're like, out. look, there's no indentation on the carpet where it was. I'm like, but no, I'm closer to the uh, window now. Only people who would say that are people who vacuumed up yeah, those yeah, indentations. Yeah. They buffed out the yeah. They thought about it. And they want you to know oh. they thought about it and fixed yeah. it. Yeah. It made me feel crazy. Or was just your stuff moved slightly? No, the I was desk just, itself. Was close, like I was Is it possible close. the wall was moved closer to the desk? Yes. Room? Now that's a good theory. Yeah. Because I could see the, the indentation. the would stay yeah. the same. But I could see where the wall had been. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and they were, they were still building and moving the wall when you got there. You're like, like what are all these different. workers doing? Yeah, what are these workers doing? Have they moved my desk? <laughs> <laughs> so, so they had their bag stolen, and this was bad news because that's where they hid their passports. Ah. So that's a bummer. But later they found their passports on a shelf in the wardrobe, the thief having removed them from the bag and left them there for them. They were like, what, what is this? It's kind of considerate. It, yeah. But also, but is it considerate to hide them in the water? When you put them on the bed or something where it's really obvious? Yeah, because otherwise you've already gone through the process of replacing yeah, the passport. Yeah, they probably cancelled the passport by the time they found it and gone, oh, fuck. Yeah, and they're expensive. Passports aren't cheap. Mm. They had to go get a new photo taken and they're never good. Yeah, if you, you want to go on holiday to Quebec, for example, yeah. you're going to need one because it's in the Caribbean. Oh, I can't <laughs> wait for my passport to expire next year. I get a new Quarabian. photo. <laughs> Caribbean. <laughs> You get a new, are you not unhappy with your photo? Oh, it's horrendous. <laughs> <laughs> Have you not seen it? I'm sure I've shown you. Yeah. On our many travels. I've never seen a good one. I had to get a new passport for when we went to the UK last year. And I went to a chemist and the man taking the photo was about 85 years old. Good. But he said he could do it. And I got the photo. I reckon I looked quite hot in the photo. <laughs> I sent it in and they sent it back saying uh, it had been taken improperly. Oh, damn <laughs> and it. And was... Um, you were wearing a hat and sunglasses. <laughs> and you were smiling. <laughs> giving him the finger. The guy said it was fine. He said he was an expert. I didn't have the heart to go back. You know, because it's like 20, 20 or $30 to get yeah, these professional photos. I didn't have the heart to go back and tell him. So you didn't come on that trip with us? No. no. Because I didn't want to offend an old man. <laughs> well, that, yeah. But it I is got, funny that the chemist is the one trusted with the photos. Yeah, and I, but I got a second photo taken. Is that a Jerry Seinfeld bit? <laughs> it feels like, what is it with these chemists? <laughs> taking the photos for the passports? <laughs> That's a good bit. He's the uh, king. In summary, I don't look as hot in the second that set of photos. That is disappointing. Mm. So, so that guy had a gift, just not the passport Well, gift. I think <laughs> the rules basically say you can't look hot. Yeah, maybe, do you reckon that's why it was yeah. rejected? Yeah. You, yeah. Looked, you don't look this hot. I'm the guy who in. came up with the rules, it was real. I'll go. <laughs> I'm going to go in with a full face of makeup. Yeah. Like too much makeup. Like Marge Simpson yes, when they the, shoot the gun the of makeup, makeup gun. at I'm going to go in like that. What and be was like, the setting what do you mean? that he you had it set on? Whore. Whore. I don't think they'd write that. Can't say that anymore. You can't. Say that. <laughs> but my favourite alarm, the everything's okay alarm. <laughs> this alarm will sound every three <laughs> seconds unless everything's not okay. <laughs> Turn it off. It can't be turned off, <laughs> though it does break easily. <laughs> sorry, that's too many Simpsons references. But all right, sorry, man. This is one of my favourite things from the whole story, but it doesn't matter at all. But right. uh, one local resident, Fred King, had his sugar bowl stolen. <laughs> <laughs> For years afterwards, his friends nicknamed him. Sugar bowl. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, you want to come around for a beer, sugar bowl? (laughs) And he hates it. (laughs) Did he see (laughs) <laughs> he hates it, so he hates this thief so much. <laughs> he, this thief ruined my life. <laughs> my mysterious sugar bowl. That would be annoying. Did he put sugar in it or did he pull the sugar out of the bed and just he take could, the bowl? He could have taken anything. Yeah, he and he took my sugar, sugar bowl. bowl. <laughs> why didn't he just... Why aren't I called like Bowie Knife or something <laughs> cool? <laughs> Why didn't he steal my jackhammer <laughs> or my cobra? <laughs> Come along, cobra, jackhammer. <laughs> Come on, sugar bowl. Bowl. Please. <laughs> Come back and take something else. <laughs> Please. <laughs> sugar you stole my cobra. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Man, that was absolutely worth it. So that funny. is the best bit of the story That's for fantastic. sure. The sugar fact that he, he hates the guy as well. Such a clumsy nickname. <laughs> Call him sugar or something. Yeah, not even sugar, sugar or bowl. Oh. Sugar oh, that's bowl. so fun. That's funny. Uh, the Pine Tree Camp, a children's camp 
uh, was the main victim of the mysterious thief. Actually, I've written children's camp, but I don't think it was. I think it was a camp for uh, disabled children and adults. Was uh, was the main victim of the mysterious thief. I think so that's tragic. To the, that's the place that is being yeah. stolen. Yeah, and that's why I think some people are like this is pretty fucked. Um, Finkel described it as their own personal Costco. They'd break in and pilfer food and drinks, but never expensive items, then leave without a trace. Many residents of North Pond were scared. Every time they went out, they were afraid someone was in the trees watching them. When they went to the wood pile of an evening, they felt like they were being watched as well. Every time they returned from the shops, they were bracing for the stranger to be there. The theory that the thief was some sort of forest-dwelling hermit grew popular. I mean, wouldn't that that'd be the case, right? If your place is being robbed, you know, every few months or something, yeah. you'd just be paranoid and you know that all around the neighbourhood there's this mysterious thief. It's I mean, just it, yeah, that uncomfortable feeling of somebody being in your, your house. Going through your stuff and yeah. being in your house. But I, I was just thinking that it sounds like someone, like it sounds like a doomsday prepper, you right. know, just like stocking up on stuff Yeah, in right. a bunker somewhere. Yeah. That's what I think. Early prediction. I think, it's a, I think it's a bear. Okay. Okay. Highly skilled. A very stealthy Maybe bear. Maybe a doomsday bear. Yeah, <laughs> sugar bowl. <laughs> All bears need sugar bowls. Sugar bowl does sound like a, something Winnie the Pooh would steal. <laughs> yeah. So. yeah. And he is, of course, a doomsday prepper. <laughs> yeah. Notorious, yeah. Oh, I mean, honey is the only food substance that never goes off. Is that true? So, there you go. I did not never know that. Never goes off. I found, like, ancient, like, Egyptian... Honey. Really? Still good. Still technically edible. Yeah. Technically. <laughs> technically. That means it tastes like shit. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it tastes great, but yeah, it lasts forever. If okay. it's stored properly, I guess, I guess it's a. Like big in thing. a tomb. Yes. Ah. Mummified honey. Mm-hmm. That's what I call Tutankhamen. <laughs> <laughs> He's my mummified honey. <laughs> <laughs> mummified honey, I'm home. <laughs> Uh, so the theory that the thief was some sort of forest-dwelling hermit grew popular, with many of the town referring to the mysterious thief as the North Pond Hermit, some sort of mysterious bearded mountain man. One resident, Debbie Baker, had young children who were terrified of the hermit. So to quell their fears, the family renamed him the Hungry Man, which to me is way, <laughs> way scarier. Worse, yeah. right? Wow. The hung- he sounds like a that's a horror Honey, film don't guy. Don't worry, he's just going to break in and eat you. <laughs> yeah, he's a hungry man. He <laughs> doesn't sound like he's going to eat you. Yeah, that's terrifying. The her- hermit. I would have just got him hermit crabs. <laughs> <laughs> then they love hermits. <laughs> he's snip snip snipping <laughs> his way around. It's adorable. It's adorable. In a little shell. Uh, in the early two thousands, there was finally a breakthrough. So this is you know fifteen odd years. It's wild that it's been going on for that long. Matt, you'd just be like, there'd be kids who have known nothing else but just living in a place that is, you know, broken into all, all the time. time. And then is it, oh, people have upped their security, but has anyone got, like, security cameras? Or oh, well, that's... Uh, or has anyone moved? Because, like, you'd be worried. No, I, well, I imagine some did, but most were just like... Well, this sucks. Yeah, exactly. Uh, in the early 2000s, there was finally a breakthrough. Uh, as well as renaming the hermit the Hungry Man, the bakers also installed a hidden security camera. Oh. It's in a I mean, teddy bear, like a nanny cam. <laughs> but and the interest, you'd think, why didn't they do it earlier? Yeah. That's what I was thinking. But uh, well, this next little section's from Finkel's book, A Stranger in the Woods, which I've just listened to the audio book version of over the last week, and it's so good. Uh, highly awesome. recommend it. Finkel Is doesn't it actually narrate good, it. or it's like funny good. No, it's really good. Oh, cool. Yeah, I I loved it. Um, well, I mean, it was this story, but he also goes in a, uh, he sort of zigs out, zigzags in and out of different theories on life and stuff as well. It was, it was an interesting listen. Uh, so this is from that book. As the price and size of motion sensing security cameras decreased, several families installed them. So I think that's the main thing. Mm-hmm. They were, like a lot of tech was just too expensive for normal people to have in the 80s. Yeah. And into the 90s. Um, you, I mean, you kids wouldn't know this, but things used to cost a pretty penny. When I was a kid, potato cakes could cost 10 cents. <laughs> that <laughs> might not when be you true. were a kid, you used pennies. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, <laughs> 10 pennies. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at one, the, uh, Finkel goes on. Or Fankel. Finkel. I think I've called him, I'll call him both Finkel and Fankel as the report goes on, I just realised. Just in case. Mickey Fink. Mickey the Fink. Uh, at one cabin where the camera was hidden in a smoke detector, this was at the baker's place. That's smart. There was success. The hermit was captured on film. 
peering into a refrigerator. The images were confusing, though. The thief's face wasn't in focus, but they appeared to show a clean, well-dressed man who was neither emaciated nor bearded, highly unlikely to have been roughing it in the woods. He didn't appear nimble or strong or even outdoorsy. Mr. Ordinary, one person called him. <laughs> which is a cool wrestler name. Yeah. <laughs> so is he wearing some sort of three-piece suit? No, he's just sort of wearing sort of casual winter clothes. Uh or that would be disappointing. Yeah. You're like, huh. Because yeah. you've built up this image in your head and he's just like Some a normal person. Some sort of a person. hobgoblin with a beard. I reckon he's just Do like... Do normal a, hobgoblins have beards? I assume so. Yeah. He's just a regular person who's like bored. <laughs> it's part of the, It's like a fun game now. Oh, it like sort of turns out to be, it's like the school principal or something. Everyone knows this guy. Yeah, maybe. He's just breaking in for fun. Yeah, it's just like he did it a couple of times... For shits and gigs and now it's just sort of like it's a bit of a rush and then people talk about him all the time but he like, kind of like likes s- fucking with people like a serial killer without the killing part yeah, yeah right so there's still something not right up here yeah yeah, yeah. but almost know. like it became an addiction you yeah, yeah and say. like in, enjoying the notoriety like oh totally what and have you heard to... about the hermit lately huh yeah reading oh, about yeah. it in the paper hearing other people talking about it maybe sort of having your own thoughts like yeah I know I'm so, I'm so scared I reckon <laughs> it's a man bird I reckon it's a man bird who swoops in and he, he <laughs> Take that's why he likes batteries because uh, shiny s- something about yeah, the shining of them and he makes nests, battery nests. <laughs> that's what I reckon. That's anyway, I reckon. back to work. That's why they call them battery hens. <laughs> <laughs> I assume. I assume they that's good. Batteries, <laughs> that's very good, Dave. Uh, that's my new favorite bit. Uh, <laughs> well, equal with Sugar Bowl. Sugar Bowl, no, sugar it can't bowl. be equal with Sugar Bowl. Sugar Bowl was <laughs> the greatest, and thing they that's all would have been standing around the bar, and one goes. I reckon we should call him Sugar Bowl. <laughs> and they went, yeah, Sugar Bowl. <laughs> Please. No. <laughs> no. I was just telling no. you that my house is broken into. Oh, no. He's trying to open up with him. Yeah. I'm, guys, I'm actually real freaked out. This my Sugar Bowl is taken. <laughs> hey, look, look at Sugar Bowl sugar sharing. Bowl. Guys, that was my, mo- my late mother's Sugar Bowl. It was all I had left of it. Oh, late mother's Sugar Bowl. <laughs> LM Sugar Bowl over here. <laughs> that's why... Um, that's why you should never open up to friends. Yeah, yeah just in case. Mm. They will rip you. They will. Uh, Finkel ends this paragraph saying, it was probable, you know, talking about it now that they call him Mr. Ordinary, or one person did anyway, it was probable people deduced that this so-called hermit had been a neighbour all along. Mm. Much like you just deduced as well. Uh, the police were confident that with these images, they would soon arrest their man. They posted the photos all around town. Offers went from cabin to cabin. Officers, did I say that? Did I say he that said right? offers. He said offers, but, <laughs> but offers I mean, makes more sense. Are they asking, <laughs> taking offers? What do you reckon? Three bucks, we'll catch him tomorrow? Or <laughs> no? Two bucks, all right, you're on. Officers went from cabin to cabin, but nobody could identify the man pictured. And the break-ins continued for another decade. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> they have a photo of him. Yeah. But that, like, okay, so... So it's not the principal, obviously. Okay. But he's aware that there's been... Th- that there's security footage of him and that they're looking for him and also probably aware that more people are going to get security cameras. Yeah. But he keeps going. Yeah. Well, you assume he's aware of this. Yeah, I do assume he's aware of it. Assuming one of the officers knocked on his door and said, do you know this man? Yeah, and he went, oh, they've got a photo of me. <laughs> no, I've never, <laughs> never no, seen him mean, before. No, I they posted them all around town yeah. and stuff. Never seen this good looking man in my life, but God, what a mug. Wow, he's gorgeous. <laughs> but the fact that uh, no one recognised him maybe suggests he doesn't get around town. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Maybe he's right. not from town. Maybe flying he's still in, a bit of a recluse. Flying in from Quebec. Maybe he's not from town. That's mm. interesting too, yeah. Some residents grew impatient. One man, Neil Patterson, whose family had a place on the pond for a half a century, started hiding in his house overnight with a gun in his hand. He hiding in his house overnight. Yeah, lights out. Basically. But he's hiding. Was he like sl- hiding in his bed with a pillow here? <laughs> Doing up here, here. Pretending Eyes to be asleep, closed. snoring, for example, yeah. for eight hours a day. Perfect. Every night. The perfect disguise. <laughs> what a good hiding, hiding in plain sight. So basically, he was sleeping with a gun under his pillow, which we all do every night. Obviously. No, I think what he was doing was he was sitting, Waiting, facing the yeah. windows and door with the gun cocked and loaded. God, that's scary. Oh, I mean, if it's, this has been happening for decades, you'd be like, all right, one of us has got to catch him. Yeah. Yeah. You'd, but, you'd, yeah. Uh, he's if he's in a rocking chair, he does look insane. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. He stayed up for 14 nights straight with a magnum in his hand without result, and he gave up. You do hope he's sleeping in the day, you know, just putting himself on night shift. Yeah. 
That's what I hope. You hope. Otherwise, he'll, he'll die. Honestly, who knows with Neil Patterson? You know what he's like. Yeah. Uh, by 2013, there had been... So it's, this started in the 80s. By 2013... Oh, my God. There'd been around 25 years of investigating the North Pond Hermit. He's got to be an old man by now. Finkel writes that these include foot searches, flyovers, fingerprint dusting, and it was conducted by four separate law enforcement agencies, two county sheriff's departments, the state police, and the game warden office, and no one had even figured out the hermit's name. They just had no idea He who never it was. left fingerprints? Apparently not, or none that they found, and if they found them, none that were on record. To match Yeah, to. right, of course. Because it would be, if you were the local sheriff, it would be like the bane of your existence. Yeah. Totally. You'd be pretty embarrassed that you can't catch this guy. Yeah, it'd be like your whole career. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine it would be multiple sheriffs. Yeah, totally. There would You'd have been someone who retired without uh, getting a result. Jeez, that would suck. That would be but so I'm frustrating. I'm not retiring until we get this <laughs> yeah. guy. Yeah. We got his photo. <laughs> He's still doing it. <laughs> he was at my house last night. <laughs> All right, Sugar Bowl, settle down. <laughs> <laughs> we get it. Oh, my God, Sugar Bowl. <laughs> yep, 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 yep. At, at I don't even know what a Sugar Bowl is. <laughs> Do you know what a Sugar Bowl is? Yeah, it's a bowl you put sugar in, but Dave. But just sugar? Yes, it's a sugar bowl. This isn't another dinnerware scenario, Dave. <laughs> what this is mean? what it says it is. What do you mean a sugar bowl? It's a, like a bowl. You have a little spoon in it. Oh, Often yeah, it's got a little right. divot for where right, the, the spoon sits. Yeah, exactly. yeah, I'm with you. And it's it'll, got a little lid on it'll top. It's a little lid. Okay, I'm with you. I don't yeah, drink. You don't really see him anymore. I know, but like you grew up in a house. Did they? <laughs> <laughs> True. Well, my dad is watching this and he'll be able to comment along. Uh, equals is what my dad would use. Oh, what about equal your mum? Tablets. Yeah, tablets. What about your mum? Mum, no sugar. So there's just no sugar no, in there your house. No, we did have a sugar bowl, to be honest. I think my new nickname should be Sugar Bowl <laughs> as punishment. I'm so sorry. I was thinking, like, did he mean, like, a cake bowl? And I was like, why is it just a sugar? A cake bowl? Like, you know, um, <laughs> fuck. What, what, would, what, would you, what bowl would you use to make a cake in with flour and stuff? Like what a would, mixing bowl. Mixing bowl. There you go. I don't cook. Yeah, no, we know, mate. Um, and Martin, have a word with your son, would you? Um, sugar, sugar bowl. bowl. Sugar bowl. So sorry. Um, please do go on. At this point, uh, Sergeant Terry Hughes, a state game warden, up the ante. He'd been working as a main game warden for 18 years at that point. Main game. And had grown frustrated by the lack of results in this case. I'd never heard the term game warden before. I don't think we really have an equivalent here. Do you know, have you heard of it? It's like a forest ranger or something? Yeah, I guess that's sort of what it is. So they're... Um, Game wardens enforce laws around hunting, trapping, Jenga. fishing, Jenga, <laughs> and recreational vehicle use. That's and Scrabble. I'm afraid you've rolled doubles three times. It's straight to jail for you, I'm afraid. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, I take my job very seriously. <laughs> and if you don't go to jail on the board, I will take you to jail in real life. So. <laughs> Prior to being a warden, Hughes was a US Marine for 10 years. He spoke with some friends who worked in Homeland Security and organised some state-of-the-art surveillance equipment. They told him it was far too sophisticated for anything a game warden might need, but he insisted it was perfect. He organised three of the Border Patrol agents to visit the Pine Tree Camp. They ha uh, hid sensors in the camp kitchen and the unit that received the data back at Hughes' home, uh, which was only a short drive away. Right. If a sensor was tripped, an alarm would sound to alert Hughes. He'd be both alerted and alarmed. <laughs> <laughs> would there be an alarm, like, at the camp, or was it just an alarm for him? Just an alarm for him. Smart. Yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. It's funny, because, like, the way it's they, the, the lead-up to this, he, like, he was talking to all these different security experts, and uh, it took him a while to find the right thing, and apparently this was brand-new, state-of-the-art, top-of-the-range security wow. equipment. But to me, it just sounds like a sensor with an alarm, like a remote alarm. We've got that here. Yeah, I feel like that's just... <laughs> As he essentially Essentially, he's installed some sort of um, doorbell camera. <laughs> <laughs> I think sure, yeah. we've got him, guys. Well, we've I, got like, him. I, don't, I don't know exactly why, but apparently this is like top of the range, expensive stuff. <laughs> anyway, so Hughes learnt the system from back to front. The plan was when the intruder <laughs> tripped one of the sensors, he would be there in a flash to arrest him. I'll be there in a jiffy. <laughs> but the hermit had evaded capture for a quarter of a century. He knew that there was no room for error. Hughes rehearsed getting from his house to the camp over and over, shaving seconds of his time each with each practice run, almost like he was training for the Olympics or something. He learnt where the camp sensor lights were so he didn't set them off. 
and uh, alert the hermit to his arrival, obviously. So if he, he drove in and the lights went off, he's like, well, the hermit's going to see that and get away again. So he, I'm feeling tense now. He, he found a spot to ditch his truck so that he didn't get too close to the camp for the engine to be heard. Every night he set out his gear on top of the stairs, gun, flashlight, phone, handcuffs and runners. Every night... Just sleep with your runners on. That's going to save ages. Sometimes, especially when I'm in a hurry, can't get those fuckers on. Mm. And then you go, oh, I left a sock in there for some reason. Mm-hmm. And you go, get that out. And then one of them is still tied up and you're like, how did I get it off? And then, you know, mm. it's a nightmare. That's smart. Leave, leave your runners on in bed and your gun. In bed. Leave it cocked and loaded. You don't want to waste any time having to do that bit going... Crack. That take, that's seconds. Yeah. That felt like hours watching you do I that. I need to get then. a bit of WD40 double 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 yes. on, uh, on my cock. <laughs> <laughs> the cock of my gun, Jess. <laughs> Obviously, uh, you I, I know a bit about guns. I know all the lingo. <laughs> Sounds to me like you've got a bit of a creaky cock. Over i got there. a creaky cock. <laughs> Oil can. <laughs> it's my favourite bit of The Wizard of Oz. Maybe the only bit I remember of it. The Tin Man saying out the corner of his mouth, Oil can. <laughs> Good stuff. <laughs> uh, so every night he went to bed ready. He set his stuff up. He was in bed. He was ready to go. Two, week, two weeks went by without incident. Then one night in April 2013, Hughes was nudged awake by his wife. The alarm, uh, the alarm was sounding. Was she heard it. <laughs> but he, he was just—he was so ready, but it, the alarm didn't wake him up. But it, luckily, it woke his wife up. She goes, hey, "Mostly, Terry, like, turn it off, Terry. <laughs> Terry, it's been going off for fifteen minutes. <laughs> Terry, that toy you've got going is—it's it's, it's happening." So he goes, "Oh shit!" He grabs his gun, his torch, chucks on his runners, still in his pajama pants, uh, jumps into his truck, fangs it to the pine tree camp. <laughs> He keeps his headlights off and parks his car in the predetermined location. From there, he sprints to the kitchen building where he ducks down, heart racing. Oh, my God. He has made it from his bed to the camp's kitchen in four minutes flat. Whoa! Isn't that amazing? I don't think I'd get out of my house that fast. No, God, no. We know you don't, man. <laughs> and it wasn't... Y- <laughs> <laughs> Snooze. <laughs> four minutes and five seconds ago, he was asleep. Yeah. That is wild. I feel so anxious right now. Finkel takes up the story from here. I really like Finkel's writing. Hughes takes a breath. Then he cautiously lifts his head and steals a peek through the window, straining his eyes against the dimness of the pine tree kitchen. And he sees it, a person carrying a flashlight, the pale beam emanating from the open door of the walk-in freezer. (laughs) Could this really, after all these years, be him? It must be. The beam brightens and Hughes tenses... And out of the freezer steps a man hauling a backpack. He's not quite what Hughes expected. The man is bigger, for one thing, and cleaner. His face freshly shaved. He's wearing large, nerdy eyeglasses and a wool ski cap. He roams the kitchen, seemingly unconcerned, selecting items as if in a grocery store. Hughes quietly moves away from the building to call a friend in the police. Robberies aren't really the jurisdiction of game wardens. According to Finkel, this is more of a spare time obsession for Hughes. Isn't that amazing? Like how the effort he's gone into is really more of just a hobby. And now he's got to call someone else in. Yeah. <laughs> it's not even your jurisdiction. Because he can't really make... Yeah. Unless the, unless the hermit was in there fishing illegally. <laughs> <laughs> or cheating at Jenga. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, where'd you get those fish sticks? <laughs> I'm going to need a set of license. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, an illegal haul. You've, you're only allowed seven fish sticks. Do you? I sort of feel like either we've got him, or he'll get away. He'll somehow. disappear for another six years. I reckon what that. Do you I reckon? reckon they're the two main options. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I hate it when you do that because I always say dumb shit like that, and then you point it out, and I go, "Oh yeah." <laughs> no <laughs> way. That's our relationship. <laughs> one of us says something dumb, and the other one points it out to us. <laughs> but I to- no, I actually do totally get what you mean. I feel the same way in that obviously those are the two options. I but it does feel like feel he's like going to get away and then it'll be a couple more years and he'll be his obsession totally. could deepen. Maybe. Oh, man, I feel so anxious. Finkel continues. Quote, he asked the dispatch office of the main state police to alert trooper Diane Vance, who has also been chasing the hermit. They've been colleagues forever, Hughes and Vance, both graduating from their respective academies the same year, then working together on and off for nearly two decades. His idea is to let Vance handle the arrest, 
and the paperwork. <laughs> <laughs> he, Smart reti- man. he returns to the window to keep guard. When the man moves towards the door to exit the building, can you tell uh, the paragraphs I read the Finkel's writing and then mine that are real like basic plain? So he didn't say fang it, did he? No, that yeah. was me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when the man moves towards a door to exit the building, Hughes moves around to confront him. Fans hasn't had time to arrive, so he's going to have to take him down alone. <gasps> Finkel goes on. He is as prepared as possible for whatever might happen. Fist fight to shoot out. Hughes is 44 years old, but still as strong as a rookie, with a jarhead haircut and a paper crease jawline. <laughs> he teaches hand-to-hand defensive tactics at the main criminal justice academy. No way he's going to step aside and let the intruder go. The opportunity to, distru- to disrupt a felon in progress overrides all concerns. The burglar, Hughes thinks, is probably a military vet and therefore likely armed. Maybe this guy's combat ability is as good as his forest skills. Hughes holds his position by the cherry red door. Glock in his right hand, flashlight in his left. His back against the building's wall. He waits, running the contingencies through his mind until he hears a small clink and sees the door handle turning. I love it. Finkel's variety. It really puts you the scene, <laughs> oh, that, is, that is tense. I highly <laughs> recommend the audio book. And you're listening to this as you go to sleep at night? Yeah. <laughs> the narrator does voices and stuff as well. So good. <laughs> uh, anyway, he goes on. The burglar steps out of the dining hall and Hughes flips on his mag light, blazing it directly in the man's eyes and trains the three fifty seven Magnum square in the centre of his nose, steadying his gun a hand atop his flashlight hand, both arms extended. The two men are maybe maybe a body's length apart, so Hughes hops back a few feet. He doesn't want the guy lurging at him, while ferociously bellowing a single phrase, get on the ground, get on the ground, get on the ground. <laughs> Perhaps surprisingly, the hermit meekly complies. By the time police troop advance arrives, Hughes has the hermit on the ground. They go through his bag and pockets finding candy and meat, His wallet provides no ID but a wad of cash, a few hundred dollars worth, much of it old, some of it mouldy. He's been arrested. (gasps) They got him! (sighs) And he's also got that kid's candy on him 25 years later. Yeah. (laughs) Is he going to return that property? Loves candy. He's got money on him, but it's old money. Like he's never used... He's old money. (laughs) He's old money. (laughs) He hasn't used his money because he's just been stealing shit. Yeah. The two officers take the man inside. To this point, he has not responded to any of their questions. Finkel describes the man when he was caught. He is wearing new-looking blue jeans, a hooded grey sweatshirt, a sweatshirt, and uh, under a nice Columbia jacket and sturdy work boots. It's like he's just gone shopping at the mall. His backpack is from LL Bean. I don't know why that is, but I love it. <laughs> he looked tight. <laughs> <laughs> Only his eyeglasses with chunky plastic frames seem outdated. There's no dirt on him anywhere, and little more than a shading of stubble on his chin. He has no noticeable body odour. His, his thinning hair, mostly covered by a wool cap, is neatly cropped. His skin is, is strangely pale, with several scabs on his wrists. He's a little over six feet tall and broad-shouldered, maybe 180 pounds. The story of the hermit living in the harsh main elements always seemed too fantastical to Vance. No one... Oh, this is the trooper. Uh... No one can survive for one winter, let alone decades of winter in the below freezing temperatures of the main outback. And now seeing him, she feels more certain. He, ne- this guy did not survive those winters. As Finkel writes, no way did this guy emerge from the woods. He has a home somewhere or a hotel room and was just coming around to burglarise places. Hotel room for 25 years. <laughs> staying at the Hilton. Mate, it is cheaper to like buy a place, yeah. honestly. He's been staying in the penthouse. <laughs> it goes past 2am and the man still isn't talking, so the officers try a change of tact. Hughes offers the man a drink of water and some cookies. Vance removes his handcuffs and speaks with him alone. Asking his name once more, the man finally replies, My name is Christopher Thomas Knight. So they got a name. Oh my god! They uh, they call back to the you know police head office and go, uh, is there any is there a missing person report? Has he got a criminal record? They f- nothing comes back at all. There's no information on him. Wow! But now I'm going to tell you a bit about this man, Christopher Knight. Knight was born on the seventh of December, nineteen sixty-five. 
He lived in Albion, Maine, a rural community located on the northeast side of Kennebec County in central Maine, around a 40-minute drive from where he was arrested at the Pine Tree Camp. He had four older brothers and a younger sister. He lived a relatively happy childhood with his siblings, but they weren't the Brady Bunch. The family was very private, not super emotional. So they didn't... Not they didn't very emotionally a, close. Didn't have a TV show broadcasting Did, their lives. Is that exactly, what you mean? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> uh, they didn't have uh, three very lovely ladies and three boys of his own or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> However that jingle goes. How about Alice? Do they have an Alice? Do they have Alice? Ah, uh, they did have yeah. an Alice. They got a sassy so. housekeeper. And a, and a butcher. Uh, from memory. Uh, reading was encouraged. He hunted moose with his father. Moose? Moose. The reason Finkel is the primary source on this subject is because he's the only journalist Knight has spoken to since being arrested seven years ago. According to Finkel, Knight had a fine childhood and good parents. Knight told him he had excellent grades in high school, though no friends, and graduated early. Like two of his brothers, he enrolled in a nine-month electronics course at Sylvania Technical School in Waltham, Massachusetts. <laughs> then, still in Waltham, he took a job installing home and vehicle alarm systems. Valuable knowledge to have once he started stealing. Yeah. Not worked in the alarm installation job for less than a year before he quit. He drove back to Maine, driving past his childhood home without stopping, just for, quote, one last look around before continuing north to where Maine really gets rugged, telling Fink Finkel. I drove until I was nearly out of gas. I took a small road, then a small road off, a, off that small road, then a trail off that. From there, he parked his car, left his keys in it, and then in the summer of 1986, Knight headed into the wilderness. So he's 21. He's 20. So young. And just did that. Some good math, Dave. And then just went, all right. Um, I'm leaving the car behind, I'm leaving my life behind, I'm going bush. And he planned to live or do you reckon he was, thought he would die? Uh, well, I guess he... I don't know if he had huge plans. Uh, this Crazy. Is he, this is what he said. It's absolutely wild. I had a backpack with minimal stuff. I had no plans. I had no map. I didn't know where I was going. I just walked away. Was he listening to Craig David as no, he I hit the post? Well, he was on uh, Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> at first, he moved around a lot, camping at different sites for a week or two before moving on, hiking south, saying, I lost track of where I was. I didn't care. Amazingly, before heading into the bush, Knight had never spent a night in a tent before. He was pretty handy. I think he, he, he grew up on a little farm. He knew the outdoors pretty well, although he grew up in sort of a farming area and this yeah. is more like rugged lakes and, you know, forest country. So it's quite different, but still. I reckon that that is actually to his advantage because camping is horrific. Yeah, he wouldn't so have he done it. he didn't know how bad it was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he foraged for food at first, eating roadkill. He then started taking vegetables from gardens. Quote, but I wanted more than vegetables. It took a while to overcome my scruples. I was always scared when stealing, always. He'd make sure no one was home, then commit the burglaries in the dead of night. Quote, it was usually 1 or 2 a.m. I'd go in, hit the cabinets, the refrigerator, in and out. My heart was soaring. My heart rate was soaring. It was not a comfortable act. I took no pleasure in it, none at all, and I wanted it over as, as quickly as possible. It was quite different, you know, you were thinking, oh, it's someone yeah. who's doing it for the thrill of it. Yeah. It was quite the opposite. It was like, I need these things. To survive. But I don't, I don't want to work for them. I don't want to, I guess, you know, obviously. Yeah. It didn't, I don't want to live a normal life in society. Um, so this is how he chose to do it. Knight continued to move around over the following two years before settling in one location for the next 25 years. He had one camp as his home. Once he found a spot he thought ideal, he settled in. Due to the brutally cold winters, most North Pond residents Finkel spoke to found it hard to believe Knight's story, that he camped through it all, especially as Knight insisted he never lit a campfire as the smoke would have alerted people to his existence. Sugar Bowl in particular was like, <laughs> this guy's full of shit. I think he, t he said, Fink he goes to Finkel, this is in the book, he says, do you mind if I swear? <laughs> he's, fu he's fucking full of shit or something like that. And then <laughs> he This guy ruined my life. <laughs> <laughs> my wife left me. I can't be married to a man called Sugar Bowl. <laughs> I won't be Mrs. Sugar Bowl. <laughs> 
Uh, according to Finkel, many insisted that he either had help or spent the winters in unoccupied cabins. I challenged Chris myself. You must, I said, have had assistance at some time or slept in a cabin or used a bathroom. Never once did I sleep inside, he said. He never used a shower or a toilet. After being arrested, he led officers Vance and Hughes to his campsite. They couldn't believe it. It was all true. Knight really did brave the conditions for all those years. Plenty of locals still doubt his stories. I mean, just because he's shown you the campsite doesn't mean he was there true. every single night for 25 years. But I guess the camp, just seeing the campsite, it's like this is – there's he's evidence clean. that this has been around for uh, 25 years. Old newspapers and magazines yeah. – or not newspaper, magazines. And just like – it was just – obvious that it had been that settled in uh he he some of the magazines he collected once he finished reading them he bundled them into bricks and used them as flooring so you could actually see uh, as it went down almost like an ecological dig am i using that word right yeah right that's amazing uh um you can see the years going back to the late 80s but he's clean shaven he's wearing like clean relatively new clothes he doesn't smell but he's never had a shower well, he, he uh, sponge baths himself. <laughs> There's a shower area at the camp. Yeah, okay. He bathes. And he steals new clothes. Right. He steals uh, soap. He steals disposable razors. Okay. Um, he's explained it all to Finkel. And, and Finkel's like, I fully believe him. Vance also says, I, my job is d- uh, figuring out what, uh, what criminals are lying to me. And I just believe this guy. So, but then a lot of other people say he is full of shit. There's no way because it's really, really cold, isn't it? Well, uh, yes. The at the coldest it gets to negative twenty Fahrenheit, which is nearly negative thirty Celsius. No, thank you. Like temperatures that I've never experienced. It's been about fifteen here this week, and I'm like, it's too cold. Oh, no, it, is, <laughs> it is so cold. We put this heater week. on. I'm very cold. Yeah, <laughs> my nipples are erect right now. I'm inside, and what is it? Ten degrees. Or yeah. Something? Thank you for negative giving me the 30. jumper. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, thank you for giving me that image. (laughs) I don't know. I I always welcome information about your nips. No, I'm all right. I'm all right over here. So, you know, just so everyone knows. Padded bra, I'm good. (laughs) You'll never know. This thing might shock you. (gasps) The campsite was on private property, only a a few hundred feet from the nearest cabin. But it was in the perfect spot, concealed by thick bush and boulders. A few hundred feet? A few hundred feet from a cabin. And they had no idea he was there. Yeah. So they don't even go for a walk when they're at the cabin. Well, I think they, <laughs> I think they do, but it's just such thick wow. scrub that you just can't. It's it's so well hidden. Hence, you can't light a fire. Yeah, that's right. Because you notice be a like, fire a couple um, hundred feet away. Yeah. Finkel visited the camp a few months after the arrest. He described it like this: "My goodness," which I. It felt like I'm all of a sudden I'm picturing Dave Warnicky writing this. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> my goodness. That's such a Warnicky <laughs> phrase. My goodness. Chris had carved from the chaos a bedroom size clearing, completely invisible from a few steps away. Situated on a slight rise that allowed enough breeze to keep the mosquitoes away. That's another thing. So it gets brutally cold, but the insects are full on at other times of the year. It just sounds like it's it's very. There's a few parts of the year where it's paradise, and then the the rest of the time there's something that would just make me go nuts. Why not steal like a really big tent? You know, you can get those ones that are like three rooms. They have like a living room in them. But get that, one of those. That's kind of what he's created with tarps and stuff. It's a huge like the photos of it. It's like this is a huge place. He's got wow. a tent to sleep in. He's also stolen a bed frame for his mattress. Like he's living pretty comfortably. Wow. Get uh, one of those um, heated blankets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, it was surrounded by a natural stone hedge of, hedge of boulders. Overhead tree branches linked to form a trellis-like canopy that masked his sight from the air. This is why Chris's skin was so pale. He'd lived in perpetual shade. I ended up staying there three nights as Finkel. Why? Watching the rabbits <laughs> by day. <laughs> Why? Why? They just escaped out of you. Why? <laughs> yes, Why did he stay yeah. there? I think I guess he's a journalist, right? You know, you were you studied journalism. That's what oh, you do. You get in there, you find the story, you live it, you oh. breathe it. Uh, he watched the rabbits by day, at night picking out a few stars behind the scrim of branches. It was as gorgeous and peaceful a place as I had ever spent time. He, lo- he loved it. He thought it was amazing. But that wasn't during he winter. Did, he though, went there it? during summer in the, yeah. the ideal time to be there. By the time Finkel visited the site, the police had cleared much of Knight's setup. 
but from photos and talking tonight, Finkel paints a, paints a pretty vivid picture, saying, He slept in a simple camping tent, tent, which he covered by several layers of brown tarps. Camouflage, he felt, was essential. He didn't want to risk anything shiny catching someone's eye, so he spray-painted in foresty colours his garbage bins and his coolers and his cooking pot. He even painted his clothes pins green. So he had a clothesline... He's got a cooking pot. He's got my, a cooking pot. He's stolen like pots and pans. My big question there is garbage bins. Is he taking out the trash? <laughs> is he recycling? He, well, he's he's, he's, <laughs> he's got his own it? landfill area. So, and Finkel goes through it. At I suppose because that, that would be evidence that you've been yeah. there for ages too, wouldn't it? Yeah, exactly. Uh, he had a kitchen area which he cooked on a stolen two burner stove, which is why he needed to seal so many propane tanks. Uh, though he has said that, quote, cooking is too kind a of word for what I did. His diet never evolved. This sounds a bit like you too, Dave. Right. Uh, his diet never evolved from the one he had when he was a 20-year-old. Finkel went through the campsite's buried rubbish, uncovering, amongst other things, quote, a five-pound tub that once held marshmallow fluff, an empty <laughs> box of devil dogs, peanut butter, Cheetos, honey, graham crackers, cool whip, <laughs> tuna fish, coffee, tater tots, pudding, soda, El Monterey, spicy jalapeno chimichangas, <laughs> and on and on and on. It sounds like you had a It's just like a real like, uni, uni student diet. Uh, despite Knight's sickly diet, he swears he never got sick. To get cold or flu, you need to have interaction with other people, and he avoided that for 27 years. Oh, yeah, that's pretty amazing. Only twice in all that time did he have brief interactions with people. Well, once when he um, walked past a hiker and he was like, hi, that's all he said to them. And another time right towards the end of the 27 years when some fishermen stumbled upon him and he had to be like, hey, I'm trying to not be known out here and they made a deal that they wouldn't tell anyone. Um, so, yeah, that were the only two right. very brief and conversations. And they obviously the followed through and didn't tell anyone. Yeah. And he apparently he didn't really talk to himself, so he just he just hardly spoke. So he had to almost relearn how to speak uh, once he was caught. So that, that also sort of tells you why he was so quiet once he was busted. Yeah. Did he write anything down? No. Nah. He said that's he, he said he wanted to take all his thoughts with him to the grave. He expected to never come out. And if he ever came out, it would only be by force, which is what happened. So he didn't necessarily know, like I suspected before, like that people were aware of him. Exactly. He didn't know that. Yeah. So he was there, everyone around him. He must have known that. They were, you know, he was making so many robberies. He He's estimated about 40 a year, which equals over a 1,000 break-ins over his time, um, which makes Finkel say probably one of the biggest uh, burglars of all time in Maine, if you count, you know, amount of times Yeah, yeah and he's so successful Not the too. amount of stuff, stuff he stole, because it's normally amount of like 18 bucks or... And totally, re- like, it, it makes sense that he's not taking jewellery and expensive stuff because he's got no use for it. He's, he's not no going to sell it. it. And exactly. But he also, he tried, in his mind, he had a moral code. So he'd steal things, uh, but he'd be thinking about the people. Great. For his talking, thinking about that disabled school, obviously. When he was yeah, that's that sort of stuff. His, he, his younger sister, who he said when he was asked, did he miss his family, said he missed some of them sometimes. Uh, but his younger sister had Down syndrome. So like, it's not like he wouldn't have had any empathy and he, he was the a relative he missed the most because he she was the sibling closest to him in age yeah right. he hung out with the most as a child and well i don't know i don't want to jump ahead too much but did he re- reconcile with the family at all i'll get i will yeah, get to all that's, that that's yeah that's so interesting isn't it because i assume been gone for so that long. they think he's probably dead yeah uh so his only real am- – so I found that fascinating. He never got sick 27 years. Yeah. Locals are like, bullshit. <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> bullshit. We get Every- sick all the time. Is- I think they just – they were hurt by him. Totally. He, he-, he freaked them out for a quarter of a century, so yeah. they hate him. They're a not- lot of them do. They're not reacting logically. They're reacting emotionally. Yeah. They're like, fuck this guy. <laughs> uh, Finkel has said in the book somewhere, he's like, if, if you – they took it personally if you believed his story. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that means you don't believe them. Uh, his only real ail- ailment was that his teeth were in a bad way, which isn't surprising uh, considering his diet. Oh. Though he did brush his teeth every day, but he obviously didn't make it to the dentist. So, I yeah. didn't go for 10 years and I had to have very expensive surgery. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, his teeth are probably no good. Uh, he Now I go every six months. Nice. Found a dentist who doesn't scare me. So, like, uh, like I said before, he had a bathroom area which he kept stocked with stolen toilet paper and hand sanitizer. 
Um, he also had a laundry area. One of the guys who suggested this topic did so because of how the world's in lockdown. He's like, this might be a good topic for... This guy did lockdown for a long time. Um, it's amazing. So many things happened and you just didn't outside. know about it. Well, that's not quite true either. Oh, uh, did he keep still newspapers? It sounds like he really had everything he needed. Finkel writes, he stole deodorant, disposable razors, flashlights, snow boots, spices, mouse traps, spray paint and electrical tape. He took pel- pillows off beds. He kept three different types of thermometers in camp, digital, mercury and spring-loaded, knowing the exact temperature was mandatory. He stole watches... He had to be sure while on a raid that he could return to camp before daybreak. That was one of his rules. He only—he was almost like a vampire. Only was out at uh, night time. He had bags stashed on the edge of camp with a second tent and other supplies so that he could make a getaway if his camp was ever discovered. Like he was fully committed to escaping uh, the world. To pass the time, he would read books. He would basically read whatever he could get his hands on during his raids. Magazines, novels, non-fiction... And he read a lot. Like he, it sounds like he he read hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books. What would he do with the books? Uh, after like, he did read he keep them? them or yeah, yeah, I don't know because he the magazines he turned into bricks. I'm not sure what he did with the books. I imagine, yeah, imagine he he kept them in some way because mm. he he never returned anything. Yeah. Um, uh, he also stole radios and like listening to talkback radio, including Rush Limbaugh or. Yeah, who's like a conservative talkback host. He also list, loved listening to music. He enjoyed classical music, but loved classic rock. He had strong opinions on all this stuff. Honestly, if people are up for a, uh, an audio book or a book, there's a, way more colour and um, extra information that I don't have time to go into. But yeah, he had thoughts on uh, which classical um, composers were worth his time and which weren't and all this sort of stuff. So, Mate, right, you've right, got endless a, time. I've got endless time, but not in this episode. <laughs> Do I? I thought you said you had somewhere to be. <laughs> Didn't you say you got to move house later? Yeah. All right. All no, right. I mean, now he... I'm going to go into alphabetically what he thought about all the classic composers. How can he be fussy? Like, that's not worth my time. Well, I oh, mean. Oh, sorry, him. I him, thought you meant you. me. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> I'm so defensive. <laughs> um, actually. Oh, uh, I'm doing this for you, actually. So. Uh, he loved classical music, or he enjoyed classical music, but he loved classic rock. That was where it was at, Akadaka and all that sort of stuff, especially Leonard Skinner. According to Finkel, he he had all this, like, he sounded almost like a, um, even though he was never, never studied at university, he sort of sounded like an academic, the way he talked about books and stuff, uh, much like how I sound. <laughs> uh, books and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but he said that he never had more praise for anything than he did for Leonard Skinner. Uh, <laughs> quote, they will be playing Leonard Skinner's songs in a thousand years. That is definitely not true, Christopher. <laughs> <laughs> not. Uh, oh, honey. That's wh- cute. Uh, he had a TV f- even for a while, a little black and white portable TV, but he found that it drained too much power from his batteries. This is, uh, obviously, he needed the batteries for uh, radios and those sort of things. He was very handy with the batteries, able to rig them all up for his various needs. When he gave TV away, he found a way to listen to the TV on the radio. Uh, his favourite programs being Seinfeld and Everybody Loves Raymond. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's all I need I like, to hear about That creamer guy sounds hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine, like, you're just hearing the applause of the crowd yeah, as Kramer Anders, but you don't know why. <laughs> All right, something there has happened. Uh, <laughs> Knight's whole year was planned around surviving the harsh winters, and they were harsh. <laughs> the, like I said before, they got as low as negative 20 Fahrenheit, around negative 30 degrees Celsius. Crazy cold. Summer was the busiest time for holiday makers at the North Pond. So as they started leaving at the end of the season, Knight got to work. It was his busiest time of the year. The first thing on his to-do list was to fatten himself up for the cold. I gorged myself on sugar and alcohol, he said. It's the quickest way to gain weight. From the bowl. And I liked the inebriation. He was too young to go to (laughs) bars when he went bush, and it probably wasn't his scene anyway. And his eccentric taste in alcohol probably reflects this. Finkel, uh, Finkel, Finkel listed some of the empty bottles he found at the camp, including Allen's coffee-flavoured brandy, Seagram's escaped strawberry daiquiri, and something called whipped chocolate valley vines. And on the label it said, fine chocolate, whipped cream, wet red wine. <laughs> oh! <laughs> <That's> oh! <all. laughs> 
Yuck. What a wild combo. No, thank you. Maybe chocolate and whipped cream. Sure. Red wine by itself. Okay. What a wild combo. All together, combo. no thank you. Mm. Whipped I, cream with red wine. I'd love to get something that could curdle with the wine, please. <laughs> Do you have anything in the curdling sort of I area? I want something to sit in my stomach and just kind of gurgle for a while. <laughs> As the temperature started to go south, he grew his beard out to help insulate his face. Through the rest of the year, he would stay clean-shaven with the help of the stolen razors. And, then, and part of that was if he ever got caught or if he ever stumbled upon someone, they'd be like, oh, he's just some holiday maker. Doesn't look like a bush, yeah, yeah, yeah. bush guy. Uh, he also made more regular raids during this time. So this is his busy time. Post-summer, leading up to the winter. Yeah. Making sure he had as much food and propane as possible for the winter. Knight was so careful about remaining hidden that he never left a footprint behind, meaning once the snow started to fall in November, he rarely left his camp as it would be impossible to get around without leaving tracks in the snow. He stayed bunkered down for the following five months-ish. Finkel asked Knight if he went into some sort of human hibernation and slept through a lot of those months, but Knight replied, completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. It's dangerous to sleep too long in winter. During the coldest months, Knight would sleep from 7.30 p.m. to 2 a.m., with being awoken by an alarm. This meant that he would be awake through the coldest part of the day, saying, if you try and sleep through that kind of cold, you might never wake up. At 2 a.m., he'd walk around his camp and try to get the blood flowing. He'd also melt some snow on his stove, which would become his drinking water for the day. He had stolen great winter gear, but was never, never able to get his feet to fully thaw though he never lost any toes to frostbite. If things weren't tough enough, some winters he ran out of food whilst bunkered down. These were brutal times. Knight described it as, quote, physical, emotional, and psychological pain. Imagine that cold, no food. It's just an absolute nightmare. Um, So what would he do to try and hang on? He'd just hang on or um, maybe he'd have to, he'd listen to the radio for a snow report. And if snow, he knew snow was coming, he'd get out and do a, a quick raid, knowing that the fresh snow would cover his tracks. Wow. So he, so maybe he'd have to wait for days or, or who knows how long before um, the conditions would be right. The cash, he found in, uh, the cash that was found on him when he was arrested was stolen a couple of dollars at a time during his raids. It was some sort of backup plan. There was a store where he could buy food not too far away. But if he didn't use it then, when he was out of food, he never would, and he never did. So that's why some of it was old and mouldy, because he'd had it for 27 years sitting in the same wallet I'm that was out there in the it. elements. And yeah. But according to Finkel, quote, when he heard the song of the chickadees, he told me he could finally relax. That alerted me that winter is starting to lessen its grip, that the end is near, that spring is coming, and I'm still alive. Whoa. Finkel goes on, the cold never got easier. All his winter camping expertise felt offset by advancing age. Quote, You should have seen me in my 20s, he boasted. I was lord of the woods. I ruled the land I walked upon. I was tough and clever. <laughs> I quite love that. Uh, I love that confidence. Yeah. But then you just got older and it was yeah. just tougher every year. Of but over time, like an aging athlete, his body began to break down. The biggest issue was his eyesight. For the last 10 years, anything beyond an arm's length was a blur. I used my ears more than my eyes. If he saw a pair of glasses during a break-in, he always tried them on, but was unable to find a better prescription. His agility faded, bruises took longer to heal, his teeth constantly hurt. Sound, to me, it sounds like it would have been a relief to get busted, but... I reckon. The only downside, because like, surely he's got to go to prison, and therefore he's going to be surrounded by people, and that would be his worst nightmare. But uh, you get fed, <laughs> you got a bed... You don't have to try and survive winter. Yeah. You know? Yeah. A lot of pros. Yeah, that's right. And I think, yeah, maybe he begrudgingly accepted some of those yeah. eventually. But he hated it at first. Uh, all this came to an end on April the 4th, 2013, when Game Warden Terry Hughes caught him at the Pine Tree Camp. Based on the timing, Knight must have just been coming out of his winter hibernation. You'd be like, Can't, couldn't this have happened at the end? You know, just pre-winter? Yeah. Shattered. Uh, Knight was obviously unable to make bail. Uh, the the mouldy notes weren't enough. So he remained behind bars while his crimes were investigated and his court date was set. Within days of his time at Kennebec County Jail, he caught an awful head cold, his first in over 27 years. His, his immunity was... Yeah, yeah, so low. But apparently after that, his immunity caught up and he, and he 
um, didn't really get sick much after that. He got a new pair of glasses. Again, his first in over 27 years. So he could sort of like see again. He would uh, have had headaches from straining all the yeah. time. And then you'd get new glasses and you'd have a bit of a headache to adjust to that. And then smooth sailing. It almost feels like you'd be better off just getting rid of the glasses altogether at some point. Yeah, probably. But I'm, I should say I'm not an optometrist. Mm. Okay, thank I you. I think you'd be better clarifying. off just removing his eyes altogether. Yeah, get rid of them. Who needs them? You use he's your got, ears more. He's got ears now. <laughs> he became he's a got Batman. Ears now. <laughs> he, had, he always had them, Dave. He had ears. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, he hated jail but was a model prisoner. He grew out his beard. <laughs> he almost looked hot. <laughs> Almost to play. <laughs> yeah, it was it was on the jail calendar. Yeah, oh my god, check out March, oh, Mr. November. <laughs> <laughs> so he grew out his beard, almost like he was playing the role of the hermit that everyone expected of him. But he also sort of saw it as a bit of a mask. You know, yeah, he right. did. You know, he like you said, he didn't want to be around all these people, so he grew out the mask as uh, some sort of a buffer. He assumed uh, both of his parents would have died while he was in the woods, though he found out. Uh, that while uh, while he was in there, his father passed away 12 years earlier, but his mother, Joyce Knight, was still alive, then into her 80s. Wow. His mother held out hope that her son was alive throughout it all, oh. and his brothers humoured her, so they all assumed him to be dead. Oh, my They'd God. They'd say stuff like, oh, he's probably on an adventure in Texas. He's having a great time, <laughs> Mum. Yeah, he's all right. And they're looking at each other like, <laughs> he's definitely dead. <laughs> the family possibly hired a private investigator to try and track him down. Uh, but that hasn't been confirmed. They're very private. They won't talk to Finkel. Wow. Uh, they also live in the forest. But so. they never reported him missing to police. Uh, quote, culturally, my family's old Yankee, Knight told Finkel. We're not emotionally bleeding all over each other. We're not touchy-feely. Stoicism is expected. That's why, I guess that's why they didn't report him missing to a police. They're like, we don't rely on you. We're self-sufficient. Uh, he asked the police to not contact his mother when he got out. He was ashamed of his criminal behaviour. The police agreed, but the story was so big that it was only a matter of time before she found out. So he eventually allowed them to contact her. Apparently, when Trooper Vance called, she was at first in shock, then mad about the crimes, this is his mother, and then said, at my age, that's a lot to take in. <laughs> <laughs> You're not wrong, Joyce. So your son's alive. He's, uh, he's been a criminal for 27 years, yeah. um, hiding in the bushes. Any questions? Okay. Uh, okay. I'm getting it in a moment. Uh, a bit of <laughs> Which son? <laughs> <laughs> Not Ron. I saw him the other week. <laughs> You're telling me he was living in a forest? <laughs> I went to his house for lunch. <laughs> what? Whose house was that? <laughs> no, Christopher. Oh. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. I oh, thought cool. it was in Texas. A <laughs> <laughs> uh, night didn't allow his mum to visit, saying, Look at me. I'm in my prison clothes. That's not how I was raised. I couldn't face her. He wasn't raised in prison clothes. <laughs> <laughs> Surprising. Yeah. Isn't that, it feels brutal, though. Going, I don't want her to visit me. Yeah, that's but awful. He, but he also said I'd, he was doing it to protect her. He yeah. didn't think she'd be able to take it. It'd be a lot to take in. <laughs> Two of his brothers... Is it just because he was wearing orange it just wasn't in his colour yeah, wheel? it wasn't in his wheel. I wouldn't let my mum see me in orange. That's for sure. <laughs> I'd say, don't look at me! <laughs> Two of his brothers, Joel and Tim, did visit, though Knight admitted I didn't recognise them. Not Ron, though. Yeah, Ron didn't. He didn't recognise him. No. That's sad. On October the 28th, 2013, Christopher Knight appeared in Kennebec County Superior uh, Court, pleading guilty to 13 counts of burglary and theft. Based on Knight's maths, he committed over a 1,000 robberies in the 27 years he was living as a hermit, but they were only able to make 13 counts stick due to statutes of limitations oh, and lack of evidence. Shit. According to Fen uh, Fenkel, Finkel, <laughs> he was sentenced to seven months in jail. He'd already served all but a week of this, waiting for his case to be resolved. The sentence was far more lenient than it could have been, though even the prosecutor said a long-term prison term seemed cruel in this case. Chris was ordered to meet with a judge every Monday and avoid alcohol and either find a job or go to school. If he violated these terms, he could be sent to prison for seven years. Uh, despite all the music and reading and Everybody Loves Raymond, the number <laughs> one thing Knight spent his time doing was nothing. That's why he likes Seinfeld, I guess. Uh, <laughs> and when Finkel asked Knight about the nothingness, he had some interesting things to say. Quote, First, he was never for a moment in all 27 years bored. He was never lonely. He said that he felt almost the opposite of that. 
He said he felt utterly and intricately connected to everything else in the world. It was difficult for him to tell where his body ended and the woods began. He said he felt this utter communion with nature and the outside world. I mean, that's mainly because he couldn't see anything. <laughs> uh, according to an article in The Atlantic, the forest granted him freedom, privacy and serenity, and it transformed his brain. He developed photographic recall, a proclivity for deep contemplation, and a limitless attention span. That's something that Finkel said. He just remembered every line of every book he read. He, he just seemed to be able to... And he said, I, I don't have photographic memory, but to Finkel it seemed like he did. Yeah. And, and one of the thoughts is that it was just having all that time that basically expanded his brain. Wow. And, that's all, and uh, Finkel's book goes into this sort of stuff a lot. He explores... <laughs> Um, hermits and and <laughs> what um, being alone <laughs> and <laughs> peace and quiet can Just do remember, for you. I remember every shit I took in every <laughs> hole I dug. <laughs> Each of them different and <laughs> special in their own way. He didn't feel good about re-entering the world, but he had to by court order. And he and he said, um, you know, he, he agreed he w- wouldn't go back to the criminal life. He wasn't allowed to go back to the bush and he didn't. Mm. He moved back into his childhood bedroom and worked for his brother for food and rent. He hated how the world had changed, saying, I don't like what I see in the society I'm about to enter. I don't think I'm going to fit in. It's too loud, too colourful. The lack of aesthetics, the crudeness, the inanities, the trivia. So he sounds like, yeah. That's like, I mean, that anyone who hated society before yeah. isn't going to like, like thinking the world's too modern and fast-paced in the 80s, is going to hate it now, oh, obviously. Yeah. Apparently um, someone said, uh, you know, it's, it's great, you can have this phone, you can do so much stuff, but he hated all that stuff. He's like, people are using their computers to listen to music. It's like a $1,000 computer and you're basically using it to listen to the radio. <laughs> and he goes... Um, People are texting on their phones. It's basically an expensive telegram machine. <laughs> it's like we're moving backwards. So like, what, what, what's your point? Do you want us to... You know, like, he's complaining about everything. Yeah. But it's, it's funny that he's sort of complaining about it and talking about everyone else like they're idiots, but, like, listening to it, you're like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know, dickhead. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's, that's the point. Yeah, I know. It's an interesting thing. You'd think he'd be he'd like that. Oh, it's going back to sort of you don't have to talk on the phone. Apparently during prison he never called anyone. He didn't want to speak on the phone. He never really liked phones anyway. Wow. Um, what an interesting Yeah, guy. well, that's pretty much the end of the report. Um, there's obviously a lot of detail, colour and that sort of stuff that uh, I w- yeah, I've recommended a few times, but yeah. Mickey the Fink. Mickey Fink's book. So good. Amazing. And, and So he's just still living a normal life then? Yeah, well, I mean, this is only a, f- a few years ago now. Yeah. This is six years he re-entered society, and um, so so amazing. As far as I know, yeah, he's he's keep you know he's sort of keeping a low-profile life. How old would he be now? Uh, he's into his fifties, sort of mid-fifties. Far out. What a wild story, wild Matty story. Shoe. Can I just say, amazing report. Great, gripping. Great stuff. I've really this week has been. Yeah, I've been, I've been you know like you do when you write a report. I've just lived that for a week or yeah. so, and it's. It's always funny. Like, it's funny to think in a year I won't be able to remember a single thing about this. But <laughs> Because if I went to the woods, though, I'd remember yeah, every line remember of it. remember it all. Yeah. Because I don't know how you feel about it, but during um, reading it, apart from the winter stuff, I'm like, that's fucked. Mm. But a lot of it, I'm like, I love the idea of this. I reckon I could do it, just go live out in the bush by myself. Forever. <sighs> Or for a long stretch, I think I would, would really enjoy that. So you'd enjoy a camping holiday? <laughs> By myself for years. You need, <laughs> mate, you need two weeks at a big four and you'll be right. <laughs> you'll be right. <laughs> <laughs> you just caravan park sort of. Let me tell you, you need two weeks at a big <laughs> four. Let me, tell you. Off out. Let me tell you. Beach house location. Pool, you they got a it. barbecue area. They got everything you need. <laughs> Fuck, Dave, that's so funny. <laughs> Well, it is now time, I guess, for the fact, quote, or question section, which is what a lot of people say is the best part of the show. I don't know if I agree necessarily. I think it's the equal best part of the show. Um, but, yeah, unfortunately, the listeners are very adamant this is the best part of the show. I mean, some some say bring it to the top of the show, but we refuse. <laughs> uh, so the way you get involved in this is if you go to patreon.com slash pod and you uh, get on the Sydney Schoenberg Deluxe Memorial Rest in Peace package edition level 
and you get to give us a fact, a quote, or a question. You also get to give us a title for yourself. There's a bunch of different awards uh, on this level, including you get to uh, choo uh, vote for the topic. Uh, this week's topic was voted for by the Sydney Schoenberg level people I in a landslide. Just, coming to say they, they chose very well. <laughs> that was great. Uh, and but before we shout out to a first person, we haven't done the theme song, the jingle. Oh, so oh my God. It does have a jingle, doesn't it? How does the jingle go? Fact, quote, or question. Ding. Thank you for remembering, Dave, because I was just like, yeah, all right, here we go. Yeah, no, but I, it just doesn't feel official unless we hear that ding. These you. people would probably ask us oh, to do it again. So you're more about the ding than the... No, that's the end of the theme song, gotcha. which signals okay. now it's time for. Okay, I always great. forget about the ding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's one of my favourite You bring Simpsons it up quotes. so often. <laughs> yeah, I love forget it. about the ding. Uh, so the first fact quote or question is David Malofsky, a.k.a. A Place to Hang Your Cape. Mm -hmm. He has a website all about... Superheroes and whatnot. Yes, we've met him in London a couple of times. Fantastic Lovely chap. chap. Lovely Ameri chap. American I also, also went for chap. Um, he's given himself the title Triptych Club President, brackets, pending election. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like that. He's putting himself forward. I love the nomination. Giving yourself the nom. Presidential candidate. Yeah, love that. Oh, yeah. Very At this much. stage. Front runner. Yeah. <laughs> but That's I love the spin say. on it. Yeah. <laughs> no, I am. I'm, I'm I just am. awaiting <laughs> election. Uh, he's given us a question. And it reads thusly. People, uh, long-term listeners will know that I don't read these out till I read them out. Here I go. Firstly, some official business. Oh, I love that mm. from the press. Mm. As of March the 18th episode, the Triptych Club finally has a quorum to begin electing an executive board as laid out in the club charter of 1966. Very good year. <laughs> I would like to use this opportunity to announce my campaign for club president. My platform is a simple one as club president. I promise to add gold trim and personalised names onto the club smoking jackets. And in addition to Margarita Wednesdays, we will also be adding a weekly bottle of champagne for each member. Jeez. Oh. Buying votes. I love that. A, a weekly, weekly bottle that's of champagne. That's pretty good. That's and I, think, right. I guess this is his uh, slogan. A vote for me is a vote for bubbles. Oh, I love that. Mm. Could be confusing for chimpanzee fans out there, but... <laughs> doesn't say a lot for politics. It's just like, let's get drunk yeah. and wear cool jackets. <laughs> well, have I told you about this before? In, when I was in Year 7 um, and the Year 12s were putting themselves forward to be voted as school captain, as it was at that time, I think teachers later chose who it was going to be because uh, one guy said, if you vote for me, I'll grow an afro. <laughs> Everyone voted for him. He grew an afro and he was school captain. <laughs> that was his platform. So good. That's bad. <laughs> so after that, yeah, the teachers started nominating people. <laughs> the teachers have the final say. Vote for me, I'll grow an afro. Yep, I'm in. It was I've a got sweet no afro. leadership skills. Yeah. I don't actually give a shit about the position. Oh, no, I probably great. won't turn up to school most days, but I'll have an afro when I do. Great afro, though. Uh, now, so this is question. Inspired by the coronavirus binge buying, so that funny, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask, what's your binge buy? And I don't mean toilet paper. Mine was Reese's chocolate Easter eggs. I binge buy them even when the world isn't going crazy. What's the one thing you can't run out of? I know this for Dave. Well, there's two for me. One, which I already had a stock, a large stock of, which was baked beans. Yep. Fortunately, they last a long time. And the other thing was, which I don't often have that often uh, at home, is frozen pies. Because right. usually I'll go out and get one, but with lots of bakeries closing, it's actually a lot harder to get your hands on a good quality meat pie at the moment. So I, that's what I stocked up, got a few packets for the freezer. <gasps> Mine's so boring. I just can't run out of coffee pods <laughs> or milk so then I can have the coffee. Nice. Did you get long life just in case? Oh, good call. No, I have always been able to get milk. Okay. Sorry to brag, but I've been able to find milk every time. Nice. Yep. You've pretty got, good. You've got a nose for milk. There's been a pretty, um, a pretty solid stash uh, of chocolate. Like I don't run out of chocolate before I buy more chocolate, you know, Right. which I normally don't do. But this time it's like, well, we can't not have that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Need that. Mine's probably pasta. Bags of pasta. Yeah, good I've one. never run out of pasta bef um, before getting more pasta. Yep. Uh, I love variety. I'll go through phases of different kinds, different what's, shapes, what's, sizes. What's at the top of the list at the moment? At the moment, I'm on these little, real tiny little tubes. You know, the you get the big tubes and the penne tubes, yeah. which are just like mm. tubes cut on an angle. But these ones are real tiny little... Like macaroni? <laughs> it's almost like macaroni, but oh, it's not. Okay. But like straight macaroni. Yeah, it's like a little bit longer than macaroni, Yeah, I okay. Guess. That sounds yum. I like the, I like small stuff like yeah. that. 
I get, and then I sometimes I love big stuff like big shells or big yeah. spirals. I love big rigatoni. Oh, big rig. Yeah, I love a big rig. <laughs> I love a big, <laughs> a big rig. rig. Uh, thank you so much for your question. A good question. And for your uh, your pitch for hey, your we'll presidency. Hey, we'll put you forward, but we can't. Do we seen, even vote? We can't be. No, I don't think we vote, and we can't be seen to be influencing. Yeah, the yeah, that's we true. Get, It's a much more Australian sort of system where everyone just gets one equal vote, unlike the. The confusing American system, which I have not got my head around, no, with I the get colleges, it. right, and the super delegates. I'm, I'm no some of these phrases. I don't fully have my head I think around. It's, it. it's supposed to be based on population, but right. Well, that's all Australia it. does that kind of with the Senate, then. Yes, right. Yeah, but that's also trying to. No, be that's not population, though. No, that's, that's just making that's all, the, all the states to yeah. All the states have equal say. Yeah, in but the, the territories, upper house. not so much. Yeah. Which is one of the carrots where they have tried to encourage Northern Territory to become a state, and they didn't want to. But they're like, "You'll get more senators." I'm like, yeah. So, <laughs> but, but Northern but Australia we won't be able sounds to have shitty. And stuff. We'll have to have more of your rules. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, A Place to Hang Your Cape, a.k.a. David Malofsky. I'd also love to thank Dan Peterson, who's given himself the title Everyone's Number One Best Friend. <laughs> Jeez, that sounds exhausting. Yeah. So what many best man speeches. Yeah, so many. Uh, well, you're the number one best man I know. You, what, have you been best man three times? Uh, You've been a groomsman even more than that. Yeah. You are. A Have you lost count? You're a good friend. No, your best have man. I reckon you've told me at least three, right? Uh, yeah, three times best man. I think seven times groomsman. Amazing. <laughs> seven times best and fairest. My <laughs> first time as a bridesmaid, maid of honour. Straight so it's to the all, top. It's all downhill from here. I don't have that many friends. I work my way up from the outside of the, <laughs> on the alt, you know, of the, yeah. yeah, I start on the outside. And now I'm here. Claw yep. your way in. Uh, but anyway. <laughs> And, as, and on top of that, he'd also have to be doing all these bloody funeral speeches, whatever they call them. Mm. Eulogies. Eulogies. Mm, funeral speeches. Uh, I'd like to make a funeral speech, please. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. <laughs> bit, of, bit of shush, please. Bit of shush. Making a funeral speech. <laughs> uh, but it's another question from Dan. And Dan asks, one of my favorite episodes was the report on the Montreal screw job. Thank you so much. Mm. It was a fantastic story. If you were a professional wrestler, and I what am. would be? What would you call your signature move? Oh, okay. Jeez, you've al- almost already got a uh, Rock Johnson style elbow licking thing. Is that something he did? He used to lick his elbow and then. No, he did the people's elbow. Right. Which involved running around the ring and then sort of dropping his elbow onto the person. That's right. Yes. But it was a big. There was a big wind up to it. Lots of music, and the audience knew it, and they'd do it with him. Yeah, maybe I could be the people's liquor of elbows. Or yeah. No, or the the, the wet elbow. <laughs> yeah. I'm giving I'll him the it? wet elbow. Oh, I just licked the microphone by accident. Oh God, I meant <laughs> no. my elbow. Oh. In this climate. Oh God. Don't lick anything. No. Oh, what about my elbow? Uh, one of my best ever tweets. I don't think it got much love. Was. Uh, Everyone knows about Dwayne The Rock Johnson's people elbow, but what people don't realise, the other elbow was a bit of a recluse. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. That's funny. That's funny. Funny's funny. That's funny. And that's funny. But yeah. is your move the people's recluse? <laughs> uh, I don't know. What would what would you do, Jess? As a wrestling move? Yeah. What I'd, would you I'll call be honest, it? I zoned out for a sec there, so I had to piece it together based on Dave's explanation. Oh, yeah. We've been asked for our signature wrestling Got move. It. Um, my, my, oh, just to give you a bit more time to think about it, Stone Cold Steve Austin, he had the stunner. That was my favorite. Oh, the burger. I would <laughs> do a cartwheel yeah. and on the way down, kick him twice in the head. Oh, what do you call that? That cartwheel. <laughs> cart, cart and kick. <laughs> The the kick, wheel. kick wheel. Kick wheel. Oh, that oh, that's sounds good. sick. All right. I'm just going to say the first thing comes to my mind, pig's nipple. Um, the pig's nipple. Yeah. Now, Great. Dave, you know wrestling better than me. What would that be? Well, obviously you're a bad guy. Yeah. I'm a situation. heel. You're a heel. Are you just still thinking about your nipples? I guess so. <laughs> and pigs. <laughs> uh, the pig's nipple. Uh, I think what you do is like you get your nose or your snout, if you will. Yeah. And uh, you uh, rub it on their nipple. And sniff. Oh, I hate and make it. this noise. <laughs> <laughs> Until they go, all right, I'm out. Please stop. <laughs> this, is dis- this is literally disgusting. Oh, this wow. is literally disgusting yeah. me. I feel literally disgusting. Oh, yeah. And then they vomit. Oh. They slip in the vomit. You pin them. Done. The pig's nipple. 
Dave, that is so, That's so good. brilliant. Can you tell, brilliant. That, <laughs> tell that I'm a big wrestling fan? Yeah, yes. I can. I know all the lingo. It's beautiful. Vomit. Hey, Dave, <laughs> I'd love to thank a few other patrons, if, if I may. I'd love you to kick this off. Before, uh, I should say thank you so much, Dan. Fantastic question. Thank you, Dan. Hopefully, these were um, satisfying answers. What, the, kick wheel? Of course. Kick wheel fan- is brilliant. <laughs> the people's looking elbow. The, we- the wet elbow. Yeah. The wellbow. The wellbow. Oh, I, here he is. Oh, it's the wellbow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to pig's nipples a bit clumsy. What about pig nip? Pig nip. Oh, he's going in for a pig nip. He's going yeah, in. there it is. Oh, look at that. Because you could be like a real redneck type. Look yeah. at that ball. Go. <laughs> yeah. What I'm talking about? Especially with that hair. Yeah. I mean, just everything about you. <laughs> well, I'd be, I'd be in Australia. I'm not doing an accent. Yeah, f- yes, you are. You're Joe Dirt. <laughs> no, I'm going to be, I'm going to be Aussie Matt Stewart. Something cool like that. That's my stage Aussie name. Aussie Stewart. Yeah. Oh, they'd get you to do something like... Down under Dingo Diver. Oh, yeah, the g- Dingo Diver's in. What about they get you to do like... Your move would be called like the Crocodile Hunter or something. Yeah. 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 And you just hunt for their dick. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking that too. Which is all, I wasn't going to say it. I wasn't going to say it. The co- co- Crocodile. Let me find it. The Crocodile. I mean, there's a great porn parody title, right? Crocodile Dundee. Must exist. All right. But I'd love to thank a few other Patreons uh, yeah. who are uh, involved at the at a different level. It's the shout out level. The shout out level. You can see it if you go to patreon.com slash dig on pod. We're going back through a few that we've missed yes, due to sadly. the clumsy system on Patreon. On when you sort it by date, it would be a little bit different every week. Yeah, it's fun. Uh, but I would love to thank uh, someone who's been waiting patiently since 2018 from Berlin in Deutschland. It's Silke Westenhof or Westendorf. Probably Westendorf. Silke Westendorf. Dave, you're the German of the Westendorf. show. Westendorf. Silk Westendorf. That's Great. beautiful. What an amazing name. Incredible to have oh, you listening. You haven't given us a game yet, Jess. No. So I was thinking <laughs> uh, a location that they would hermit to. Oh, where would you hermit to? Yeah. And w- what do you can think we also a location they go to and what item they would take? For example, a sugar bowl. Okay, <laughs> great. <laughs> so great. Where, where are you going and what are you taking? With yeah, you? love that. So Ber- from Berlin. All right. So is he is he getting out to the or she, I don't she? know, Silk. Uh, getting out to the, the German countryside. Maybe somewhere way, I know this is a fair way away from Berlin, but maybe somewhere in the Black Forest. Oh, that sounds great. That sounds nice. And what? And uh, what's is Silk there cake there? Taking? There is cake there. It's a cake forest. What's Silk taking to the cake forest? Uh, cake they'll, knife. <laughs> they'll steal from a, from a local house. They will steal uh, a box, a, mm-hmm. like a wooden box. That inside of it had marbles. Okay. And then, and the person they stole from would get the nickname Marble Box. <laughs> and they'd walk around going, "I've lost me marbles." <laughs> <laughs> oh, we know. <laughs> it's Mate, all you, you lost talk your, about. You lost your marbles a long time ago. Thank no. you, Silke. Thank you. Marble Box Vestendor. <laughs> Incredible. Uh, I'd also love to thank from Jersey in Great Britain, Charlie Reeve or Rive. Oh, Charlie Rive. Charlie Rive. Charlie from, has arrived. From the Channel Islands. Yeah, where, Very cool. whereabouts, where are they getting off to? Uh, moving to a, a different Channel Island. Ooh. Ah. But maybe like an unoccupied one that no one's discovered somehow. That makes sense, yeah. That makes sense. What's the, what are they What are they st- uh, taking with them? What, what are they taking, stealing? Uh, some Polaroid film. Oh. But no camera, so... It's quite useless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they're still shaking it, you know? Yeah. I guess the blood flowing Just, in winter. Who knows? At night. <laughs> Shake it like a Polaroid picture. Yeah. Who knows? Is, it gonna, is anything going to come up? Imagine it? if it did. That'd be I'm, terrifying. I've been shaking it for years. <laughs> that'd be so scary yeah. if a photo came up. That's a great horror film premise. Yeah. Someone shaking a film for years. <laughs> may that's I think, the first hour and a half. May I thank some people as well? I would love it so much if you did. Thank you so much, Charlie. Thank, thank you, you so Charlie. much, Silke. I would love to thank, from Rhodes in New South Wales... Kayla Atkins. Oh, Kayla Atkins. Atkins. Fantastic work. Kayla, Kayla Atkins is going to uh, is going to hermit in Orange in New South Wales. Oh, oh yeah, fantastic. Because if you dress all as orange, no one will notice you. Exactly. Here's a fact I read this week: uh, the original oranges weren't orange; they were green. What? Hmm. Is that because when fruit sprouts, it is green and then goes orange? Is that but what they that rema- means? They remained green. Oh. But they were still big. Uh, cool. 
Because, you know, navels are like a... They're a, a sort of a freak. They're a, um, a, 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 like a like mutant oh. orange. And they're all... they all, all navel orange trees come from the same tree. And they're all off cuts from the same tree. And they, they're like infertile. So that's why they all have to go back from that same tree. You can't grow more navel orange trees from a navel orange or anything. I they have to go back to that. that. There's one original tree they still yeah, use. Yeah, well, I guess they've got multiple cuttings from that, but they are all traced back to that one tree, I believe, or something like that. That is incredible. And, you know, like they have that, that almost like a mini orange inside navel oranges. Sometimes they get different sizes, but there's that. That's part of the mutation. That's crazy. What's the mini orange inside? I don't eat enough oranges. Oh, navels are fantastic. They're the best eating I orange. love oranges. I don't know why I don't eat them. I could just eat an orange. Just get one of the way Valencia's are better juicing oranges, but the navels for eating, you can't top them. I should start eating oranges. Anyway, thank you to Kayla. What does Kayla steal? Oranges. Oh, yep, that from makes orange. sense. From orange. Oranges from navel orange. Navel oranges. Oh, right, but she wanted clippings, the juice. Navel tree clippings, and she keeps trying to <laughs> plant new trees from the seeds but it ain't working because she hasn't learnt that fact until did, now did she she'll, be like, she'll be agape somewhere yeah. her gob will be agape these people listening on tiny little transistor radios <laughs> yeah they're in the hermiting away I think that she went to orange seeing that as the mecca of oranges yeah. of course sadly it was not to it be it was not the case so thank you very much to Kayla I would also love to thank if I may uh, from Regina SK in Canada. I'm guessing Canada. Is that Saskatoon? Or oh, pro- no, Saskatchewan no. is the place. Saskatchewan. Saskatoon's I would love to thank place. Clayton Bender. Clayton Bender. Fantastic. Where does Clayton go? Well, I love that name, Clayton Bender. Um, he goes to uh, the Dandenongs outside of Melbourne. Oh, beautiful. And I know it's a bit of a journey. And he steals scones. He steals scones and uh, a little tea, an ornate tea set. Yeah. It's actually quite quite cute and quite And scones. the person he steals it from gets the nickname Teapot. And they're stoked about that because they run a tea shop. So it's perfect. That's a great na- nickname yeah. to a teapot. Hey. Yeah. Oi, teapot. <laughs> Oi, what te- are you looking at, teapot? <laughs> Oi, teapot. What's your fucking problem, <laughs> you toilet? Shut it. Shut, it, Shut you your toilet. teapot toilet. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that's so good. I love that very much, Clayton. Um, Clayton Bender, fantastic name. Can we come visit. So We're good. not too far away, Clayton. I know you're hermituting, so you probably won't. But but you know you could if you like. Uh, Jesse, I think you might have missed someone there yet again. A uh, couple, about three up from there. Claire Id, maybe short for Claire Idris. See her. Yeah, that one. It just says C id for me. That's why I skipped it. Oh, right. Well, I'm looking at the email address and that. Right. I sorry. I skipped that on purpose. So, oh, sorry, Claire. You've been skipped on purpose. But we're going back to you now. Sorry. We're I was like, oh, that ca- that's not full. Claire might be actually slightly um, hermitude-ish mm. as it is because she hasn't given us an address. But, yeah. what What do you think, Claire? What's Claire's... Go. Claire Hermits in the Rocky Mountains. Oh, fan, looking for Fen's treasure. Yes. Oh, so good. She's and that's what she stole. That's she how never it started. Told anyone. Yes. <laughs> that's how it started was just looking for Fen's treasure and then she decided I'm just going to stay yeah, here. But like it out she didn't find it. Wow. So she's rich, but she does, she's not using it at all. Claire, I love, I love your style. Love that. I love that energy. Good job, Claire. Sorry I skipped you on purpose. I could not read that far across. <laughs> Thank you so much, Claire. Do you want to have a crack at a couple here, David? I would love to. And the name is jumping out at me here <laughs> because it's next, but also because it's amazing. I'd like to thank all the way from Great Britain, Dylan Harvey Elvis Humphrey. Oh, Holy my shit. Oh, my gracious. God. Jeez. Named after Bob Dylan, Robert Harvey. Elvis Costello and Humphrey B. Flaubert, four of the greats. Incredible. Wow, fantastic, Dylan. Thank you so much for your support. And I think Dylan is hiding in the least populated place going around. Antarctica. Yes. Whoa. People doubt that he could survive the winters or the summers. Yeah. <laughs> but he's doing it. He's doing it. He's fine. He's thriving. He, he loves, loves it, it when summer breaks. Like, oh, oh, thank God. Oh, thank God. It's only minus 25. Catch some of these rays. Yeah. <laughs> 
Oh, that's I love that sort of. Uh, uh, and the item down. that he's taking is a large lasagna tray. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Ready. He's hoping to get some supplies. He's yet to come across sheets of pasta to make a lasagna, but one day he'll achieve his dream of having a lasagna in Antarctica. And he's absolutely left a burden behind for the man he saw it from. <laughs> hey, lasagna tray. <laughs> lasagna tray. <laughs> Oi, LT, get over here. Oh, you no. do. Oh, I don't even like lasagna that much. <laughs> I don't even miss it. I don't even miss it. I don't even replace it. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Thanks so much, Dylan. Dylan, fantastic Thanks, name. Dylan. I would now finally like to thank from Miner's Rest in Victoria. Well, that sounds, already sounds yeah. like it could be. Oh, because I don't know that town. I know Digger's Rest. does I don't sound know a little bit rest. like you'd be hiding in an old gold mine. Oh. Yes. Miner's Rest. That'd and that cool. person would be Karen Loder. Oh, Karen yes. Loder. Fantastic. Loder. Sound like an action star yourself, Karen, Karen Loder. Loder. Karen Loder reporting for Judy. <laughs> Hello, it's me, Karen Loder. All right, what we got? <laughs> yeah, I'm taking them out. That's right. <laughs> Kay Loder's in town and bad guys are getting nervy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Karen, you've obviously bought your favourite stolen item with you. What have you bought with you, brought with you? Well, I took it from my uncle Doug. He didn't see me coming or going. He was he was out at the time, and I took his whole bookshelf. The whole thing. Yeah. How'd you get it out? I took the hinges off the door. Yeah, you I'll had to it. blow the bloody doors off. I had to blow the bloody doors off. <laughs> I never said I'd blow the bloody doors off, but I did. Because I don't tell people what I'm going to do. <laughs> wow, I'm Karen, Karen Loder. Loder. You have a rich backstory, Karen Loder. And then you sleep in a gold mine at night. Yeah. Is that true? In regional Victoria, probably. <laughs> and is there a chance that you'll ever reunite with your brother, Jason Statham? <laughs> that geezer. <laughs> He's good for nothing. <laughs> Plus, if his heart rate gets too high, he dies or something. <laughs> He's a confusing character. <laughs> Liked him in Lockstock, though. <laughs> it's been emotional. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Karen Loder. A uh, real tribute to you by uh, doing your voice on the show. Yeah, you're welcome for that. And, uh, yeah, well, uh, that's all our th- uh, thank yous and shout outs. But there are potentially a few more in the Triptych Club. Let me just check that. Uh, but for the existing members and new members, Jess, they have a, a cocktail or an hors d'oeuvre oh, today. You better believe this week. it. We're talking chocolate, we're talking whipped cream. We're talking red wine. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no. Don't make them drink it. No, it turns out it's really nice. Oh, okay. Um, so we're having that. Wow. And then um, for snacks, we're going for sweet treats today. So there's just chocolate. And there's um, whipped cream and little cubes of frozen red wine. <laughs> oh, delicious. Yeah. It melts in your mouth. Wow. Dave, do you want to quickly explain what this club is? Uh, this club is for exclusively for members that have been uh, supporting us on Patreon at the uh, bonus level. Oh, bonus episode level or mm. above. Or I think shout-out shout level, level or above. above yeah. uh, for three consecutive years. So 36 straight months they've supported this show or more. And we... Cannot tell you how surprising and appreciated that is. Yeah, it's and awesome. You get, yeah, it's lifetime membership. Absolutely. So you are inducted into the Trip Ditch Club. There's snacks, there's canapes. <laughs> uh, people who aren't in the Love club music. can stand on the other side of the velvet rope and peer in. Yeah. But it's cold out there. Oh. And it's beautiful. It's perfect temperature. Whatever your perfect temperature is, it's is that. what it is inside yep. the trip. It's crazy. Fantastic. You don't know how we do it. Don't ask. And uh, we're going to have a... Uh, Any lo- music this lo- week, music. I think we're going to have a Chris Isaac doing an acoustic set. Oh, And great. you better believe Baby did a bad, bad thing. <laughs> oh. Boom, 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 boom. How's he going to do that acoustically? Just on his little guitar. Sick. And he's going to do this. Ooh. <laughs> 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 I didn't think so. <laughs> yeah. We're all joining in for the backup. And then you better hope so. <laughs> I feel like crying. <laughs> oh, wow. And then he weeps. <laughs> <laughs> he weeps because Dave's got a gun on his head. He does yeah. not want to be performing. He said, you feel like crying? Haven't you tried crying? Yeah. Don't cry for me or we'll put a bullet in your head. <laughs> It's a weird place. So come weird on place, but enjoy it. You, you love Chris. I mean, he isn't in the club, though. That's why he doesn't <laughs> yeah, get treated yeah, we're as nice well. To people <laughs> club. After <laughs> all that, do we have some inductees? We have new one inductee okay, this week. Thank goodness, because Chris thank is God. not playing to no one. <laughs> well, everyone else, I mean, there's oh, course, still uh, tens of people who are already in the club, uh, you know, mingling, having fun. Yeah, it's a good amount. It's not too crowded yet, but, you know, it, it's like enough for a vibe. Yeah. 
Uh, and this week, uh, the one inductee is from Burwood East in Victoria, Australia. It's Sophie Waldron. Oh. So- so, welcome to the club. Great to have you in. Our official photographer. <laughs> will you be taking photos of Chris Isaac? Yeah, you will. Because I'll ask you to. Thanks for the support, Sophie. Thanks, Sophie. You're the best. It does feel like we've known you a long time now yeah. and we appreciate your ongoing support. Awesome. So good. All right. Well, that pretty much brings us to the end of the episode. Anything else we need to talk about? Probably not really. I think so. This is the end of... We don't have any more live streams to plug. They're done for the time being, but... Due to the um, great response we've had, we're, we're already talking about doing it again sometime. Uh, feel free to let us know that that's a good idea or not. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I've, I've also – I did a chat with Dave recently on my YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash Matt Stewart. If you want to check that out, it's called Matt Chat. Jess, hoping to do one with you yeah. coming up. Don't do it. It's a trap. Okay, thank you. I, I really, wasn't going to. I'm, I'm basically my generation's Michael Parkinson. Wow. It's I get people to really open up. Yeah. And what then did you, you open up about, well, Dave? You open up and then he roasts you. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, oh, childhood trauma. Bang. You're like, oh, my God. Wow. I'm never opening up again. That sounds fun. Yeah, amazing. I open up fun. about my favourite type of orange juice. I will not make that mistake no, again. No, I never do that. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, Dave. I'm just getting that zone. Know, it's the roast zone. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. King of Sting. My God. <laughs> Michael Parkinson, there's Jimmy Carr. Ow, that hurts. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, and yeah, what? Um, I don't know. Yeah, our YouTube channel's there, youtube.com slash do go on pod. All our things are at do go on pod, including our Gmail address, our website with a dot com at the end, and all our social medias. So get involved in all that. If you want to, no pressure. No pressure. I you get do. It. We're also, after this little project of the live streams we've done, the next thing we're turning our attention to, which we're really excited about, is our web series coming up soon, which is going to be on the Stupid Old Channel. So definitely get on to the Stupid Old Channel uh, on YouTube and like subscribe. Like and subscribe. If you do like and subscribe, genuinely, you will be the first people to see the show. So Yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, and that should be coming, that's coming up imminently. Uh, we recorded a little while ago. Back in the bearded days. Yeah. Remember those times? Oh. Dave looks exactly the same. Jazz's Thank hair you. slightly shorter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we all look like we can go out and hug each other. Maybe we even do hug at some and we point. S- we s- well, we're, we're sitting, sitting so close. Close together, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's I camera trickery, that. but to have people look like they're sitting quite close together, you actually have to sit on top of each other. <laughs> yeah. So, which yeah. we were. Yeah. yeah. So, and there's that. cow in the background. It's actually a bundle of cats. <laughs> Sticky tape together. <laughs> anyway, that's the end of this episode. Jess has got to go move her house because she's a little bit mad. Yeah. She actually chose to move house. I know. I only do it when I'm evicted. Yeah. At genuinely, that's the last time I moved. I was kicked out. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> there were several legal ramifications. <laughs> I'm not allowed to speak about it. <laughs> well, yeah, thank you so much. We'll be back next week. But until then, thank you and goodbye. Later. Bye. Bye. podcast is part of